McDermott? Yeah. Melendez? Yeah. Mellow Miller? Yeah. Merritt? Yeah. Monahan? Yeah. Newsom? Yeah. Oliver? Yeah. Pasqualini? Yeah. Perry? Yeah. Powers? Yeah. Pacino? Yeah. Quinn? Richards? Here. Rogers? Here. Stanford? Here. Irma Streeter? Here. Jim Streeter? Here. Strode? Here. Wagner? Here. Washington? Here. Wells? Here. White House? Here. Whitney? Here. And Evan? Here. 32 present. You have more than a all right, well, good. Thank you. So we're gonna start with a moment of silence. Can you all rise, please? We'll have a salute to the flag. Uh, Representative Frickman, would you lead us off, please? <laughs> Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. What? It was a quick moment. Yeah, maybe that was too quick. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the next item on our agenda is to approve the minutes from our June 13th, 2018 meeting. Do I have a motion? Uh, Representative Powers and uh, Representative Massett, I believe, seconded it. Thank you. Okay, is there any discussion? No? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? I'm actually going to abstain because I wasn't there. Okay. All right. The minutes uh, are so approved. 31 in favor, one abstention. Yeah. So we have 32 people here? Correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. So the next item on our agenda is citizens petitions. I'm going to read. This is the portion of the RTM agenda where the RTM welcomes comments from citizens. Each presentation should be limited, in this case I'm going to say to three minutes or less, and citizens should, if possible, submit written comments. Presentations should be limited to matters pertinent to Groton. The moderator or members through the moderator shall ask questions only in order to clarify the speaker's presentation. Responses may be given by the moderator and or by the town manager. Citizens should make their presentations from the lectern and state their names and addresses for the record. And before I, excuse me. public to be limiting the uh, option for comment to as little as three minutes. All right. Well, that needs to be at least five minutes. We have quite a few, so I'm going to go with my three-minute judgment. Thank <clears throat> that you, is though, your Representative choice. Whitehouse. You weren't actually recognized, but that's fine. Um, so now, I, before I get to that, the citizens' petitions, I forgot to uh, mention that we have several members who are not able to be with us and did call uh, to let us know they weren't. Uh, Clarence Casper, Bobby Josini, Douglas Marshall. Carol Ann Quinn and Bev Washington are not able to make it tonight. So, um, so I will. I have a list, two lists here, um, of people who are going to come before us, and I'm going to time uh, three minutes. So, the first, uh, please, when you come, uh, state your name and address for the record, and you can come up and use this lectern, please. All right. So, the first person is Amy Whitehouse. minutes wasn't expecting that okay I'm gonna have to shorten this good evening my name is Amy Whitehouse and I live at 600 Meridian Street extension I'm a citizen of Groton a wife a mother a geek an event organizer and if you can't tell how much I'm shaking I have an incredible fear of public speaking I'm gonna to cut to the chase um, I'm here to talk about the BYOB ordinance um, I feel that it the way it's written right now is a huge mistake I'm encouraging the RTM to veto it simply based on the verbiage that's in there. And my main concern 
Um, actually, Councillor Franco, who's here this evening, had written in a letter um, the fact that she believes that police discretion, based on the way that the ordinance is uh, written, is totally fine, and it's not. And I have spoken with Chief Rosaro um, on several occasions in my own place of work. I've spoken with, spoken with Grand PD as well. Um, and I've always, been dealt, I've always been given professionalism from them. But police discretion in its use under an unclear ordinance with a foundation that's more like a marshmallow than concrete is actually just a nightmare for Groton PD waiting to happen. According to Black's Law Dictionary, which I believe is where Councillor Franco got her definition of police discretion, is used for domestic violence, traffic violations, potential hate crimes, and crimes involving mentally ill individuals. The other big thing about police discretion is um, it's one of the reasons behind what some people see as racial profiling as police officers are trained to use their discretion in line with statistics and perceived statistics. Police discretion is only effective, in my opinion, when proper, clear, defined laws are put into place. It's then up to the officer to determine whether or not he, should take proper, he or she should take proper action. A vague ordinance puts the officer in a dangerous situation to make their own calls on when and where to enforce the ordinance, which will result in a PR disaster. And in today's society, it is very easy for a disaster regarding police discretion to go viral. This is why the ordinance, as it is written, needs to be vetoed. Um, I went to the Midnight Hookah Lounge um, this past Saturday night um, in the early hours, and I'm going to tell you right now that the way it's written, there is definitely going to be a potential for racial discrimination um, in the people that were there um, myself and possibly one other patron were white, the rest were not. I don't believe that this is going to go over well if the police end up ticketing or arresting people because they're consuming alcohol after midnight or 1 a.m. Um, I had so much more to say, but given the fact that I'm only given three minutes, I'm going to end it there. I really do not believe that this is the right thing to do. If there's another ordinance that's put on the table in the future, maybe that's something that can be reconsidered. But as of right now, the way it's written, it's, it's going to be a disaster for the police, and I never want that to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you'd like, you can submit your statement with the town clerk. Can I give you the 10-minute one instead of the 5 You can, two? sure. I will do that. Uh, the next speaker doesn't have a last name written down. It's Ahmed. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Ahmad Faraj, and I am a Groton citizen, resident. My bad. I am a full-time student at Three Please Rivers. Please give us your address, too. Yeah. Thanks. I am a Groton resident, and I live at 32 Fort Street. I am a full-time student at Three Rivers and work the weekends at the mobile gas station next to the hookah bar. Um, I have known Mr. Abu Dawood, Abu Dawood for about a year now. Last fall, I watched him work 16-hour shifts every day to save money to open the hookah bar and take care of his family back at home in Syria. Mr. Abu, da Abu Dawood split hours between driving Uber, working at the gas station, and putting together the store. 90% of the labor that was done in the hookah bar was done by him. After finishing my shift, my friends and I would meet up at the lounge to hang out. The busiest times for the lounge are usually between 2 a.m. and 3.30, um, when the music would usually come to a halt. Time and time again, Mr. Abu Dawood has proved that he is ready to cooperate with the police to ensure no problems occur at the hookah lounge. It would be a shame to see all his hard work go to waste. Mr. Abu Dawood is a law-abiding citizen, a family man, and a mentor to me. He was never notified about the ordinance the last time around and was not given the respect he has given this town. I hope that you all stand behind him and veto this ordinance, and thank you. Thank you. If, and anyone who speaks can, if you have written comments, you're welcome to leave them. The next speaker is Hassam Abouduad. I apologize for mispronunciations in advance. Good evening. Uh, my name is Hassam Abouduad, and thank you for letting me speaking. I'm the owner of Midnight Hookah Lounge, so 403 Pleasant Valley Road South. I'm here to ask you to veto the BYOB ordinance because it will be very damaging for my business. I will probably need to close the business 
if the order is passes. Since we opened this winter, I have worked very hard to create a safe, fun place where people can get together and have a good time. Our customers include electric port employees, many Navy people, casino worker, waitress, partner their local business owner, and at least one of the state trooper. I have done my best to work with the town to get a prepare permit <coughs> and authorization at every step of my business. When first opening the business this winter, we had some trouble with a few people as quickly as we could. We hired additional security, improved our policies, and worked closely with the current police to deal with those issues. And we have not had any major problem in a few months. We have had an excellent relationship with the Grand Police Department, and we're happy to do whatever we can do to make their job easier. They and we have same goals, keeping everyone safe, and we thank them for everything they're doing for us. We even kept the maximum number of people in the lounge will be below that fire marshal authorized because we want to keep safe environments. I hope that you will vote the vetoes this ordinance so my business keep continuing to provide a safe and enjoyable experience to many residents and visitors in Grand. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Could you just state your name, uh, your address for the record? I don't think it got on, at least. Hossam Abu Daoud, 302 Thames Street in Grand. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Tim Bresnan. How you doing? My name is Tim Bresnan. I'm from Lisbon, Connecticut, 41 Schoolhouse Road. Um, I work for Sam at the Hookah Lounge. Uh, we became acquainted a few months back when he started to get busy. Um, we, we have four security guards now. We haven't had any trouble in four months. Um, we had a little trouble in the beginning. We took care of that with the Groton police. They trespassed the gentleman. We took care of all our troubles. I say four months now, we haven't had any fights, any disturbances in, in, in our club. I, I hope that everybody will, will look at the, the reality of it, that this is just another place for people to go have a good time. Maybe people that can't afford to go to a bar and have a good time. You know, for the same price of one person, six or seven people can go have a decent time, smoke their hookah, dance. I mean, we, we, we have four security guards in that small room and we have no trouble whatsoever. We haven't had any serious incidents in quite some time. Um, that's about all I can say about the place. Sam's worked very hard. He's a very good man, and I hope you people will take that into consideration and veto this ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Richard Colon. I may have mispronounced it, but not that bad. <laughs> Sorry. My name is Richard Colomb. I'm from New London, Connecticut, um, 197 Montauk. Um, the DJ at the Hookah Lounge. Um, I hope you guys veto this ordinance. I just feel not really good into politics, but I just feel that it is um, targeted towards the hookah lounge, just through everything I've seen. Um, it's gonna be the biggest business that, I mean, the, it's gonna be the biggest impact for this business, just as far as we get a lot of people that are in the industry, as far as the nightlife. We get a lot of people that come from the casinos, I'm, like I said, I'm the DJ there, so I, I communicate with a lot of these people just through m working around the area of Connecticut. So I get a lot of people that come from the casino that they'll text me like, oh, I'm coming by. And it's people that while they're working, they don't get that opportunity to drink. So they come there, drink, smoke hookah. I'm Dominican and in our culture now, it's a big thing, the hookah. Like, there's a, a lot of Dominicans that won't go to places if they don't have hookah. So the hookah with the alcohol is, is kind of hand in hand now. And our society is growing. It's not that big around here. 
um, this is the only one. But in like New York, I, I drive all the way to Providence to go drink and smoke hookah. And all my Dominican friends do. So Sam offered finally an opportunity for us around this area to have something like that. When for years we didn't have nothing. I grew up around this area. And basically after we went, after we got out the bars, we would just go to Ocean Beach and drink late night, right at the, the beach. Like, if we don't have a place, the thing is if for my group, you know, my, like, I don't know how to say it, but like my age group, if they don't have somewhere like the Midnight Hookah Lounge, how it helps out the community is that there's actually a place that they can go to. If this place was to shut down, they're not gonna have somewhere that they can go. What they're gonna do is go to a house, get drunk, because believe it or not, we're, at least there's no bartenders there, but there is security that would stop them to a certain degree. So the aspect of them getting totally wasted and annihilated is not, it's not gonna happen, because there is other people there. But at a house, you don't see how much a person consumes, or the, you don't even think about it to that degree. So after people get out of the bars at two or those people that are working and don't get that opportunity to drink are going to go somewhere where there's a crowd. And in the summertime, it's usually outside somewhere. That's all I wanted to say. And thank you for listening. Thank you. The next speaker is Giancarlo Sanchez. My name is Giancarlo Sanchez, and I'm from New London, Connecticut, 24 Cedar Grove. And I hope that you will veto, vote to veto this ordinance. That's all. Thank you. The next speaker is Megan McGuffey. Um, hello, uh, I'm Megan McGuffey. I currently live at 111 Ledgewood Road, uh, apartment 110 in Groton, Connecticut. Um, I personally know several people who work um, very odd hours at EB and other places, and places like this are one of the few places that are open late enough where they can actually enjoy entertainment the rest of us take for granted. Um, I actually have a letter here uh, from um, Mr. Joseph Stefano, and he wasn't able to attend because he starts his work at 7.30 p.m. And so I'm just gonna read off this letter here. It should fit with, well within the three minutes. Um, I'm the owner of uh, Salaba Remodeling. The reason I couldn't attend this meeting today is because I have to go back to work till probably after midnight. I then go home and shower and change to get to the lounge at around 1.30. I often work late for businesses who have daytime hours and can't close down for us to work. I personally prefer to come here because they offer more than drinks and alcohol, uh, like all the other establishments in the area. I've been t here on multiple occasions, and not once have I witnessed any violence whatsoever. And I'll also submit this for the record. Um, but as you can see, there's people here in this community who are, you know, they're hardworking citizens. They want to live in Connecticut, enjoy Connecticut, but they, um, if an ordinance like this passes, it greatly reduces what they can really enjoy while the rest of us get to still enjoy the same things we normally could. It affects a very um, specific number of people. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, if you want, you can give this to the uh, town clerk. The next speaker is Lou, Luke Bittner, and followed by Don Bittner. Hi, I'm uh, Luke Bittner. I live at 65 Pleasant Street. I'm a uh, resident of Groton, resident of the city of Groton, and um, I moved here from the uh, Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. I'm an engineer at Electric Boat. <clears throat> and I just want to say that I oppose this ordinance, and I hope you guys agree to uh, veto this, because number one, the time of day in which you choose to either rest, recuperate, or get in entertainment shouldn't have an impact on whether you can in a particular community 
There are people I would know who work on second shift at Electric Boat who work extremely hard and they deserve a chance to not have to travel super far if they're living here to enjoy themselves, to chill with their friends, people they work with. And secondly, even though this ordinance doesn't call out a particular business by name, I think there's something fundamentally sketchy about having that only affect one, one business in our community, one business that is part of our community and indicative of the type of community that we are, one that's welcoming, one that's opening. And you know, I, I bought a house in Groton, Connecticut because I fell in love with the community and I just want to see us grow. I want more nightlife options for us. I want to bring more people that I know, say, from you know, friends back home, and I want to raise a family here. I want this community to grow, I want this community to evolve, and I feel like this would just be a misstep, one that we would regret in years to come. So I, I urge you to reconsider, to veto this, so that we can look back and say, you know what, we made the right call. If we have safety issues, let's address the safety issues. Let's not cause the loss of a business in this area. One of us, really. It's not us versus anybody else. It's one of us saying, can we do this? Can I stay open? And I, I, I just, I guess we're asking for mercy. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, uh, Dawn Bittner followed by Barbara Tarbox. Hi, I'm Dawn Bittner. I also live at 65 Pleasant Street in the city of Groton. Um, I'm asking all of you to veto this ordinance um, as well. I, you know, I want to echo everything that everyone who has come before me has said, but also I just want to add that it's, like my husband said, it didn't specifically call out a business, but if it's only affecting one business and that business owner was not notified and that business owner has done everything that he can to cooperate with the town, with the city, with the laws, with the police, then the fact that we need to create an ordinance to solve a problem that doesn't exist is ridiculous. It's underhanded and frankly, even if the intentions were not meant to be discriminatory, that's what's happening here. We have the business, we have a business who is owned by a man who immigrated to this country, who fell in love with this community and wants to have and raise his family and his business here. And that's Admirable. That's not something that we should say, oh, I've heard something bad happened here. Let me try and do what I can to shut this down. That is unacceptable. That is not the kind of community that I want to be in and that I want to raise my family in. I want a place that's going to welcome me and every person here, regardless of their shade and race and religion. And this is not the community I want to be a part of. And if this is the community that it becomes, then you're going to have a very hard time keeping young people here, keeping diverse families here, and attracting other business owners. It's, it, like I said, it is unacceptable and underhanded, and I really urge you to veto this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Tarbox, followed by Margie Gookins. And now for something entirely different. Barbara Tarbach, 74 Algonquin Drive, Mystic. Tonight, the RTM will be acting on a legislative ordinance which requires a two-thirds vote to veto. The RTM will be eliminated if the proposed charter revisions are adopted, as you well know. But if the proposed charter revisions are adopted, a legislative ordinance may only be vetoed if a petition with 5% of the voters is submitted within 14 days. Then the ordinance must go to referendum, another expense. What is curious about the ordinance going to referendum is that the new charter would require that not only the ordinance be defeated, but that it be defeated by 15% of the electors. Not just a 15% turnout, but 15% of those turning out voting no. In other words, there is a minimum requirement of voters both to the turnout and to defeat the ordinance. The proposed 
<laughs> excuse me, the proposed revisions require an automatic budget referendum, but it does not require a minimum number of voters to vote in that budget referendum. No minimum turnout, no minimum vote to defeat. I find this lack of requirement for a minimum turnout or a minimum number of votes to be ironic, inconsistent, and foolish. Thank you. Thank you. Margie Gukins, followed by Robert Zuliani. Hi. I'm Margie Gukins. I live at 26 Daniel Brown Drive, Mystic. And um, last year, when I went to the voting booth to select the people that will best represent me and my interest in my town. I looked at each and every one of you very carefully. I wanted people that would be frugal not only with the budget, but that would also make rules and laws according to what's right and fair for the people of our town. I believe that all BYOBs should be regulated. They have no time limits on the consumption of alcohol. They, have, they don't have liquor licenses, nor do they have any limitations on the hours of operations. I watched on TV where the chief of police requested these hours for open liquor at BYOBs that you're gonna be voting on tonight. He only has so many men to take care of so many places that already have liquor licenses and that are subject to state laws. As you're well aware, BYOBs have no state laws regarding hours of alcohol consumption. All BYOBs in our town should be regulated. All of them should have guidelines that they must follow. If not, why should we have laws for bars that already have a liquor license and pay huge fines to get them? In all fairness to our, our existing BYOBs and to the fairness to the bars in our town, the chief's request is more than reasonable. Fairness for all is important. We have a number of BYOBs in town, and I only saw one speak against the hours of alcohol consumption at the town council meeting. If other BYOBs were against the hours, I think that they would have been present at the meeting also. I ask that you pass this new law as written in accordance with the reasoning from the chief of police. This law is for the safety of our town, just as the state laws for the bars are there for the safety of our town. This law is written and would help protect our town. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Robert Zuliani, followed by uh, Jean-Claude Amboise. Greetings to the body of the RTM. My name is Robert Zuliani. I live at 23 Cushman Street, Groton. Please excuse me for reading from notes. I don't want to miss anything I would want to say. There is one thing this body of Groton government does not receive very much of, and that is the praise and glory of all that you do month in and month out throughout your term in office. Rarely, if never, do government servants receive much praise from the public. In many ways, the public is confused regarding what you do. Actually do, actually do, not only in front of the camera, but behind the scenes researching while, you invo while involved in committee meetings. You each take your personal and valuable time to assist the people of Groton. First by running for office for your political party, once in office, freely giving of your time each month to assist in helping to keep our town moving forward. What's most impressive is you dedicate a great amount of additional time reviewing and researching the budget each year. Special committees assignments of the budget while each committee scrutinizes the dollars needed to run these departments. Those findings are then brought to the general body of the, the RTM and additional questions are brought up for discussion. Bottom line is, as a group, you understand the budget dollars and the need to the towns 
and the limitation to its and uh, the limitation it's under and are fully capable to make the right decisions while keeping the town functioning without disruption. This group functions properly and always gets the job done. I thank you for all that. I appreciate all that you each do. <clears throat> each one of you pay an important part in moving the town forward. I believe in the RTM I, and all that it does and want to keep it in place. For these reasons, because, of, because you do your job so well, I am therefore unable to support the charter revision question coming up this November. I sincerely, and I mean sincerely, thank you for everything you do. Well, thank you. Well, well anyway, you know where I'm coming from. You guys do a great job. Don't stop what you do. Um, as a group, you make the right decisions every time, in my opinion. You research and you do your homework. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate what Thank you Thank you. Jean-Claude Amboise, followed by Archie Swindell. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Madam Moderator, uh, RTM members. Good evening and Groton citizens viewing at home and here in the gallery. My name is Jean-Claude Amboise. I live at 169 Shenacosset Parkway in Groton. Uh, I am the chairman of the Vote No Charter Revisions uh, group, which is a bar bipartisan grassroots group of concerned Groton residents active in informing the voting public about the negative impacts, the radical changes that charter revision will have on our diverse community. I am coming before the, before the RTM tonight to discuss two things. Um, first, I'd like to speak about the overall harmful effects that Charter Vision will have on our deliberate budget process, elected officials, and cost implications. Second, I will discuss that agenda item that you will be uh, talking about and how that vote tonight ties into that upcoming election on the referendum. Uh, just as a quick uh, note for a timeline, 2006, the Charter Revision uh, Commission was established. Um, I did speak at the po first public hearing. 16. 2016. I did speak at the first public hearing. I did say that I think there should be changes made, um, whether it be term limits, which is not in this bill, uh, which is decreasing RTM membership, which is not in this uh, leg uh, referendum. And again, it goes on and on from there. In August of 2017, the CRC had a public hearing. An overwhelming majority of the public that was at that meeting was not in favor of these measures. And they had a lot of changes that wanted to be made. After speaking to an individual that was a commissioner, the answer was, we're doing it anyways. In October 2017, there was a town council uh, public hearing. Same result. Overwhelming majority of the individuals were not in favor of the charter revision changes. Moving forward, uh, fall uh, 2017, little change from the original report after the CRC went back and looked at it. Uh, they passed the final report with a six to one vote. And that's important because that's a 63% attendance rate. And one of the complaints that the individuals who wanted to eliminate the RTM said is that there was poor attendance. That was pretty poor attendance for a final report. November uh, 28th, 2018, I highly recommend that everyone takes a look at the YouTube site uh, for Groton Municipal Television. You can watch the, uh, the deliberations by the outgoing uh, town council. The town council rejected the final report on a vote from five to four. In the winter of 2017 into 2018, the petition got a uh, charter vision on the ballot. Again, uh, speaking to what uh, Barbara Tabox had mentioned, there was a mandated, a mandated amount of elected uh, registered voters that had to sign that petition. And for many reasons, I cannot stand, uh, I cannot approve this Groton vote, and that being one of them. The annual budget referendum uh, for town operations and for Board of Ed requires no minimum of voter turnout and no referendum trigger. Meaning that if we're actually saving taxes in the town for that particular year, we still have to go out and vote. And the whole premise, in my opinion, of what the CRC was all about was trying to save taxpayers money. Coincidentally, you're not going to save money because you're going to have to spend $20,000 for every vote every time. Um, again, I know I can hear that buzzer, so I'm going to keep it quick. Um, 
Four-year terms are too long. A, bar, a board of finance is an advisory board only with no real check for the uh, yeah. town council. And the RTM, uh, it de decreases community representation. And just one final point, please, Madam Moderator. The comparisons to other towns are not justified. We are a diverse and unique community here in Groton. Please wrap it up. Yes, please. Um, thank you. Uh, the RTM is that check on the council. If the uh, charter revision is con uh, approved, who is going to veto these uh, current legislative ordinances that are coming from the town council? Thank change for the sake you. of change is not good change for Groton. Vote no charter revisions on thank November 6th. Thank you. All right, the next uh, speaker is Archie Swindell, and you're, you can lead uh, followed by Carolyn Wilson. Thank you, Madam Moderator, and Oops. good to be here again. Um, I'm here to speak. Um, Oh, address, name. Oh, sorry. We all know I, you, but. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, Archie Swindell, 192 Monument Street in the city of Groton. Uh, I'm here to urge you to um, fine tune the BYOB ordinance. I think it makes perfectly good sense um, to structure a town ordinance so that there is a limit on when uh, BYOB uh, establishments must close. But I think it should not be different for BYOB establishments than it is for uh, places that have a liquor license that serve alcohol directly. Uh, if I read it correctly, and I admit that I am getting my information mainly from the day's article, um, the uh, BYOB uh, places have to close, I think, about an hour uh, before the regular establishment. I think that's probably wrong. Um, what do you do about that? I'm not sure uh, whether you can amend the ordinance and, or maybe you can uh, talk to the council and have them amend it. Uh, but as it stands now, I think it should be sent back to the council but I think we need some kind of ordinance. And it's not aimed at one establishment. It's aimed at structuring a, re a reasonable limit on consumption of alcohol late at night in the town. Um, as far as the budget, or as far as the uh, charter vision uh, referendum goes, I, uh, I will be voting no on that, and I think Tonight is a perfect example of the reason, one of the reasons why uh, that is true. I think people who signed the petition to put this on the ballot uh, probably did the right thing. Uh, let's let people have a choice of whether or not we want to. What I will say is to take a wrecking ball to our form of government in Groton and completely change it um, in many ways, uh, or go with what we've got, uh, which has worked well and which continues to keep the budget under control and keep the government in the hands of the people. A meeting like tonight would not take place uh, if that, those changes are passed. Um, so thank you for your service and uh, thank you. Again, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Carolyn Wilson, followed by Kevin Trejo. Uh, good evening. My name is Carolyn Wilson. I'm at 1140 Ocean Avenue in New London. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Carolyn Wilson, and I'm the coordinator for the Groton Alliance for Substance Abuse Prevention. I'm a certified health education specialist and prevention specialist. My background is in public health with a concentration in behavioral science and health promotion. I'm here to speak in reference to the BYOB ordinance. 
GASP is a community-based prevention coalition. That's mission is to prevent and reduce youth substance abuse through advocacy and education. Our coalition is guided by the strategic prevention framework and we prioritize the implementation of environmental strategies that are sustainable and can have lasting impact to affect community change. Environmental strategies make the healthy choice the easy choice in the context where strategy is being implemented, often coming in the form of policies and laws. CADCA, which is the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, provides technical assistance and mentors coalitions like GASP all across the world. CADCA has a list of seven strategies that can create community change. GASP uses this list as we select our interventions. Modifying and changing policies is one of them. Examples of environmental strategies to prevent underage drinking that GASP promotes and has supported are the social host law, which is adult liability for underage drinking on their property, providing responsible seller server training, including checking IDs and intervention procedures, and sponsoring compliance checks, ensuring that retailers and servers don't sell or serve to minors. According to CADCA, the environmental strategies approach recognizes that risks associated with substance use are in part a function of the interplay between the environments in which individuals use substances and the environment approach place matters. We recognize that managing the availability of alcohol and other drugs in specific environments impacts the substances individuals choose and the amount that they use. These decisions determine the level of risk individuals and communities experience. The ability to shape individuals' behavior by structuring what is expected or permitted in specific environments can reduce alcohol and other drug-related problems. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, Kevin Trejo followed by Richard Dixon. Kevin Trejo, 536 Shendicasset Road. I guess I'm here for a couple of reasons. Uh, I want to echo the vote no for the charter revisions. Uh, for the reasons that were stated in that, I oppose the changes that are being brought forward on that. The other one was the main reason tonight was the ordinance, the BYOB. It's come to light, and as everybody know, people are here about it. I don't see that much of a problem with passing this at all. This affects the whole town. I don't believe this was brought up just to hurt one party. I mean, this works for restaurants and everything else. I know I've been in this town 30 years, and in some places you'd like to know, pick up a bottle of wine and go in and have a nice meal. So I don't think it really addresses there are hookah lounges throughout Connecticut, Tallinn, New Haven, Manchester. They're establishments that are open all day and into the evening, and they manage to survive. So I don't know what their lawyers did or anything else when they opened up and what the changes would be, but something should have been looked forward on their business plan as they went along. I have no problem having a hookah lounge here. I mean, they're nice places. My daughter goes to them. I don't. I don't smoke. But I'm not looking to put people out of business, but I don't see how this really gets in the way of the ordinance. I figure the lawyers went over this before the council approved it and everything else. So it's legal. It's clean. So I, I don't know how you hurt other businesses over one business. So I'm for the BYOB. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard Dixon, and then if there are any other folks who w have missed the sign up and wish to speak, please let me know. My name is Richard Dixon, <coughs> excuse me, former town councilor, former member of this body for a number of years, uh, so I understand the, the process that you're going through. I'm here primarily to say that I don't think you should 
um, allow this ordinance to be passed. I think that I'm not here to say that I think a hookah bar is good or that there shouldn't be some uh, consideration of regulation. But as I hear, and again, I haven't had a chance to really get into it in great depth, but this, what I hear is that we're putting Groton at risk for having a civil rights lawsuit because this does appear to be targeted at that particular business. That's what my biggest concern is. Um, I'm not sure that there's a need for that kind of an ordinance to begin with, but if you take a look at, for example, um, 42 U.S. Code 19, uh, 1983, that's the statute that somebody would bring in an action under, uh, and I hear, for example, rumors that uh, the, the, the town attorney suggested that the town councilors not talk to the individual because he had uh, a lawyer write a letter. The town council's job is to talk to the constituents. If that rumor is true, then there's a pretty good suit line out there for somebody that wants to take it. There's also something that uh, goes right back to Article, uh, yeah, Article 1, Section 9, Paragraph 3 of the Constitution called a Bill of Attainder. That's basically, to put it in the simplest terms, where a legislative body cannot sit as a judge. Because this does have the implications that it's directed at this one establishment, then that could be considered to be a bill of attainder. It could be considered to be directed at them. That clearly would be unconstitutional. I don't want to risk the town being in that situation. Last time I told the town they were going at risk, it almost cost the town $100 million, the merit property, you may remember. I was one of the ones that said you're going about the process wrong. So I'm talking about the process now. I think you need to veto it, send it back to the council. If the council thinks that there is a need, I'm talking about a need now for a law. There's lots of laws that uh, can be used to keep the safety uh, of the area where this um, hookah bar is. Uh, so you may not have a need, but I think it needs to be fully uh, looked into. The fact that the uh, owner, as I understand, uh, didn't know about it till after uh, the public hearing uh, and didn't have an opportunity to speak or bring out the people that he did today, which is a wonderful thing to see people coming and exercising their uh, civics, their ability to come and speak to you. Um, those are all things that a good civil rights lawyer would bring to the forefront. I don't want to risk it. So send it back, as my occurred. Now, in the process of sending it back, you're also pointing out what you're here Thank for. Thank you, can you please wrap it up? Okay, I'll wrap it up by saying this is exactly what makes you relevant, why that you should remain as an august body in this town. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we are at the end of our list. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak? Uh, Town Councilor Obrey, who is an ex officio member of this group, Good evening, I'm Leanne Obrey. I live at 8 Vista Point in Groton. I am part of the council, and I only came up for, to say a couple of things. First of all, Dick, you shouldn't believe rumors. We were not told or given any direction on what we're doing from anybody. We've done it because we have a desire to make a situation better. I'm wondering how many of you remember the term paddy wagon. Well, you know, when the Irish came, they liked to drink. I'm Irish, I love to have a drink. But they used to take this wagon around at night and pick up the Irishmen, throw them in and take them home. And that's where the name the paddy wagon came from. The point I'm trying to make is we all adapt. And that's what we're looking for now, is an adaption. An adaption that's good for everybody in the town. I haven't seen anybody else that has BYO as their type of business coming in and saying they feel they're being treated unfairly. You know, we put a lot of time, a lot of thought, and a lot of effort into this, and it was not directed at anything other than safety for our community. So I think people have to adapt just like the Irish did so they didn't get their rides in the paddy wagon anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other speakers? Um, 
Town Councilor Franco. Again, Councilor Franco is an ex officio member of this body. Am I limited to three minutes? Uh, if you speak here, you are, but you can speak within the, the um, rest of it. If you're speaking as a citizen, you're limited. So I can wait till later and speak I, I would in wait fall. till later and speak longer. I'll wait later. Because you're not members of this body. Uh, and if you will, the time for citizens' uh, petitions is now over. Thank you. Um, so the next item on our agenda is receipt of communications. Uh, I did receive quite a few. I'm not going to read them because actually they were CC'd to every, they were forwarded to everyone. But I will note that I did get uh, two letters uh, from Hassam Abudawood, one from Ahmed Faraj, one from Mohammed El Obaid, uh, one from Michael Whitehouse, one from Khalid Habab, and one from Sami Faraj. Uh, those were all. Uh, in favor of vetoing the ordinance, and then I did. We did receive one from uh, Town Councilor Franco, which was um, in support of the ordinance. So those are the communications that I received. Are there any others? That's it. We're it. So uh, we're going to move on to uh, the uh, report of the town manager. Good evening. Is it sun? No. Jesse, can we have the town? Oh. Okay. Sorry. It's his first day. Somebody's <laughs> <laughs> Just do that. Thank you. Sorry about that. It's loud. <laughs> um, I've got copies of the mini budget summary over on the table. If you didn't get yours, please grab one before you leave um, for all the RTM members. And also the uh, town manager's news packets over there. Uh, financials, uh, preliminary fund balance as of June 30th, 2018, unaudited, is approximately 18 million, which is 15% of the FYE 2018 general fund adopted budget. Um, we'll have uh, final numbers for the uh, FYE 2018 will be available once all year and entries have been posted, so we should have that soon. Uh, general contingency budget for FYE 2019 um, was appropriated at four, 450000 Nothing's been taken out of that yet. And the capital reserve fund balance as of June 30, 2018, again unaudited, is estimated at $1.1 million. Well, we should have uh, final numbers soon. Uh, just a few uh, uh, updates. The uh, the uh, school superintendent sent a rounded update on the uh, via email on the uh, Groton 2020 plan, but we're working through the last bit of the deep process to get permission on the uh, swap, the additional swap of the portion of Kolnaski School. Um, it's gone to the AG's office, and we expect that to be wrapped up hopefully in the next week. Uh, uh, a lot of thanks to our various open space groups and uh, for working with us to. Uh, to uh, figure that out. So, uh, mention uh, Groton Heights, the RFPs that are out mm -hmm. to develop that property that are due back September 17th. We're getting a lot of interest, so uh, we should hear something on that hopefully soon thereafter. Um, there's going to be a job fair coming up, uh, Groton Community Job Fair, September 18th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Groton Senior Center here. Um, job seekers will have an opportunity to meet with both the Board of Ed and uh, Town of Groton, uh, Bob Zagami, thank you for heading up our portion of it. We're going to be doing, uh, besides uh, learning about positions open, we're also going to have uh, workshops on tips for job interviews, support for developing resumes, and uh, assistance with navigating the websites and online uh, application process. So a lot of good information there. Um, and uh, one mention of a sidewalk closure. Um, We've put up uh, permanent barricade, barricades blocking a portion of the sidewalk on the north side of Route 184 west of Pumpkin Hill Road. Um, very, a lot of erosion underneath the sidewalks has become dangerous, so we're getting engineering uh, costs and uh, find out what we have to do to have that fixed. And that is all I have. Thank you. So the next uh, item on the agenda is economic development. Is there a report on that? 
None. Uh, the, and the next after that is a sp superintendent of schools. And I just want to note that Superintendent Grenier is ill and did supply a report, uh, which is over on the table if you'd like to get it and read it. All right. Uh, the next, uh, Representative Katowski. What? Liaison reports. You please come forward. Oh, no, you don't have to come forward. You could do there. That's fine. The last time I came up. I was just going to ask the town manager a question. I thought it was a question. Turn up. I can't hear. I don't think your thing is on. Is it? The red button. Okay. Speak into it. I was just going to ask the town manager a question. Sure. Okay. Um, in your report, you said there's a job fair for open positions in the town and the Board of Ed. I yeah. thought we had a hiring freeze on. It's more of a hiring review, and that doesn't apply to the school either. And even if a position isn't necessarily open now, we still want people to come in and apply as positions open. But every position for the town proper that comes open, it's reviewed by myself, uh, Bob Zagami, and then the town council has to approve uh, filling it. But it's not a total freeze. Representative McDermott. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, I have a question for the town manager. John, uh, thank you for uh, following up on my suggestion about fixing up the uh, town hall entranceway. It looks 100% uh, better, and I hope people have a chance to go down there and see the difference. Uh, my question is, uh, are we going to do something about the outside of the building soon? <laughs> do we have any kind of a plan? Because well, I've been talking to the public works director about right around the immediate entrance, about getting, it's just finding the staff time. We have to check, test for lead with the paint there. There's some, you know, the paint's not looking great there. In terms of the full building, that would take a CIP to do at that cost level. We wouldn't be able to do it with existing funds. Uh, but we are discussing options. Okay, because that is like the one focal point in the town that everybody visits at one point or another, particularly people that want to do some economic development. And the town hall looks terrible. It just needs to be fixed. If we have to do it with a CIP, then I guess that's what we'll have to do. It's, have you gotten some estimates already no, that it runs yet. into that kind of a number? It, not yet. Um, well, we've done it in the past. We know what it, Gary knows what it costs in the past, but we're still debating do we do the whole building at once? Do we right now just do around the outside there by the, by the entrance? Mm -hmm. Just so people know, we had uh, painted the stairway coming into the main entrance. We painted the hall, the first floor hallway. Um, we put out uh, mulch around all the the uh, vegetation outside, repainted the town clerk's mailbox. Um, we painted around some windows outside, so we've been trying to do things to fix up the outside, too. Okay, well, you know, we're always talking about economic development, mm -hmm. and as I say, that's a focal point in the town, and that's where we should start and get that mm -hmm. accomplished. Thanks. I'll continue to pursue. Okay. Representative Bordelon. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, a question for the town manager. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering uh, where, where do we stand currently in reference to the Groton Ambulance and providing a sound lease and holding, um, making them pay a, pay a fair wage to this town? I, I had a meeting today with um, their attorney <coughs> and their president of their association, so I'm hoping to have that wrapped up soon. Mm -hmm. Well, a, a proposal for the council soon. And my other question is mm -hmm. checking the status of the lead water in our buildings, mm -hmm. um, in, in particular our new community um, recreation uh, center there. Uh, I know things of testing positive as well as uh, up at Fitch High School and, and elementary school, some more sinks exactly. were positive, which brings me to my next point. I believe Dr that's in Representative, or Superintendent Grenier's report. Just yeah, yeah I, read, I also okay. attended the meeting that they had. Okay. Um, but it is a public building. It's owned by the town um, as well as, you know, as the, as the Board of Ed is, is utilizing it. But I, I feel uh, I can speak on behalf of myself as a parent who's paying for water every day um, and the, the concern that kids are c concerned about drinking the water in that building and now newly with the field house coming on, on, on the radar for having contaminated water as well. Um, I feel that our direction in this town should be really making sure that we have drinking water. Uh, speaking you know, on the heels of a veto of a BYOB, I, I feel that the, our own water in this town is, is not safe for our, our, our children. And I just would like to hear more reports on that and really put that to the top of the list, making sure that um, parents shouldn't have to pay $1.25 a bottle. Um, I only can send my son with so much water per day as an athlete, um, two 32-ounce bottle of water and a heavy backpack already with uh, heavy books is getting a bit draining. 
um, certain sections of the building where he's at in particular, uh, it's hard to get to water. Um, and being an athlete down at the field house, I, the last I heard, they were checking the ice in the ice machine and saying it was only used for injuries. So I feel like as a community, we should really be rallying around making sure this water is safe and accessible and students should not have to be charged until we as adults get our act together. And just to note, um, as the moderator said, there is an update on the schools in the uh, superintendent's report that's been distributed, um, and the, myself and the council and the superintendent and board of ed take it very seriously. And the council's asked for regular updates from the superintendent. And just while we're on it, I'll give a quick update on our Fitch, the former Fitch Middle School. That's of course no longer a school, but it is getting it's starting to house some of our uh, uh, parks programs. Um, we did test positive in the A wing, which is that front um, portion two wing. We don't have anything in there right now, but the C wing where the parks and RECAR did test positive. Uh, all water fountains um, are, were shut off, bagged and tagged not to use. We're uh, getting water, right now we've got, I think bottled water, but we're getting water coolers in there while we figure things out. Um, hand washing stations um, uh, are being placed too, and uh, we're gonna try to figure out a plan pretty quick for how to resolve things. But. So at the high school, once again, mm -hmm. There's areas where the kids can't access water, $1.25 a bottle. It's a, it's a town building. I think it's a town concern as well as a Board of Ed concern. And at this point, I think we really need to bring it up back to the table and discuss how we can provide free water to these children. Because not everybody can afford, like I'm spending, I'm spending two to three, about $3 to f a day on water um, when he should be able to have access to drinking water. That, that should be a right to the students and uh, it's offered in small sections but it's not across the board so I'd I would encourage the town to consider putting some water stations everywhere so that kids feel safe uh, the kids have also heard about the drinking water and a lot of the kids are concerned with drinking it I'll look, I'll look further into that were there any other questions <clears throat> for the town manager hearing none let's uh, do our liaison reports representative Katowski and you could stay there if you want. It's up to you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, we were busy having fun all summer. The town council was really busy. And I want to thank Lisa and the town manager's office and Betsy for helping me put this together. These are the resolutions from the town council meetings from June 26th through September 12th. Housekeeping resolutions such as approval of meeting minutes are not included in the report. At the June 26 special meeting, the council approved a resolution for the 2018 neighborhood assistance at, oh wait, stop. There was a resolution approving the 2018 neighborhood assistance at program application for the Bill Memorial Library. At the July 3rd meeting, there was a resolution setting the referendum date and form of the question on proposed charter revisions. There was a resolution approving a special waiver of field, field rental fees. There was a resolution authorizing the Director of Public Works to continue the new consolidated middle school design in accordance with the Groton 2020 School Modernization Plan. There was a resolution authorizing the town manager to enter into an agreement with the commercial broker for the sale of the William Seeley School property. Then on to August 7th, there was a resolution uh, approving adjustment to retirement pension benefits. There was a resolution establishing a beautification committee. There was a resolution approving a grant of economic assistance to CrossFit Ingoos. What? Ingoos? Is that okay? Um, there was a resolution requiring justification for filling vacant positions. There was a resolution appointing Andre Bumgardner to the Southeast Area Transit Seat Board. There was a resolution to accept an access and utility easement from the city of Groton. There was a resolution authorizing the town manager and the police chief to sign a memorandum of understanding with the state of Connecticut Department of Emergency Services for use of the land mobile radio system. There was a resolution authorizing a nuclear safety emergency program grant and another one authorizing a modification to the part-time seasonal pay plan to include a telecommunications, telecommunicator position and to modify the pay range for supernumeraries 
There was a resolution replacing the town manager administrative assistant position with an executive assistant position. There was a resolution that the town council hold a public hearing on, eth on the ethics ordinance on September 4th, 2018 at 6.30 p.m. at the town hall annex community room. Thank you, town council. On August 14th, there was a special meeting and the public hearing was set for the conversion of the merit property for se September 4th, 2018. <coughs> On September 4th, there was a resolution approving the tentative agreement reached between the town and the Groton Telecommunications Association, United Electrical Local 222, Connecticut Independent Labor Union Local 86, etc., affiliated with United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers of America. There is a resolution authorizing the town manager to execute revised lease agreements with TVCCA for the premises at 36, 38, and 40 Central Avenue. There was a resolution setting the public hearing on the sale of town-owned property for October 2nd, 2018. There was a resolution extending the effective date of Ordinance 286 for the designation of the Planning and Zoning Commission and setting a public hearing for October 2nd, 2018. There is a res there was also a resolution approving a revised job description for the Water Pollution Division of the Public Works Department. Respectfully submitted, Roseanne Katowski. Thank you. Very good. Nice. Thank you for your service. Uh, Representative Bordelon, would you like to give us a Board of Ed update? Uh -huh. Thanks. Oops. <laughs> uh -oh. Does it, it work? It, it's still working. <laughs> there, go for it. Thank you. Um, it was a busy summer, like any, everybody said. Uh, I did happen to attend uh, a regular meeting on August 27th at 6 p.m. at the Town Hall Annex. Um, I will submit a uh, typed um, report once I have a minute. I will get that done. Um, the superintendent report, he went over the Alliance District and stated at this time we are not designated for any new money for this upcoming uh, school year at this time. Um, they also talked about APEX, a learning program. They gave an update on that. They also had a student that presented. It, it was in reference to um, a kind of a self-guided uh, program to help students in the summer um, where they can kind of advance through the modules uh, with help of the teacher and some assistance. Um, there was reports uh, and information the superintendent talked about, uh, the assistant superintendent talked about how successful the summer writing program was. And according to my notes here, it looks like 290 kids were in attendance, which is awesome. Um, they also spoke about, they, they had no health insurance report at the time. Um, Director of Building and Grounds spoke on the 2020 plan. They said it was moving along. Um, the summer projects, they were just doing cleaning and getting the schools open at that time. Uh, they did talk about the water update and stated that the field house had been uh, also positive um, and that they were trying to provide as much water down there as possible, as well as um, coordinating with Ledge Light. And he had also made a trip up to Hartford uh, to discuss um, plans of actions and, and things to do um, in reference to that. And they had some action item, items. They, um, let's see, oh, I'm sorry, new business. There was a discussion um, and possible action regarding uh, tuition grants on the IB diploma program and program tuition. Um, the elementary program, they gave a chart that stated the elementary school is $14,616 per student, middle school $16,579, high school students $16,504, and the IB program would be $19,610. And I believe this is an initiative to um, kind of, they're coming up with numbers to look at to maybe open up that IB program possibly to the outside. Um, also, they, there was a discussion of possible action regarding implement, implementation of that APEX learning program, which they did actually vote in favor of, and that's going to be implemented. Um, there was a discussion of possible action regarding um, the whole homeschooling. They had a reading on that. Uh, it was the first reading, and it just summarized into detail about coming up with an actual uh, signature contract um, to have some, uh, which the way I'm interpreting it is more accountability and a plan. They did state, though, that homeschool children would not be able to utilize any of the after-school programs. Um, at, per this contract, so that, that was one of the readings, that was the first reading on that. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, they also had discussion on the possible um, action regarding uh, reporting child abuse and neglect. They were um, working on that. 
um, in discussion, uh, that was a first reading as well, sorry, uh, discussion on possible action regarding superintendent's contract. So they went into an executive section to speak about the superintendent's <coughs> contract and at that point I was no longer there. Huh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Wells. as brief as possible. Um, there were two meetings of the Golf Advisory Board. On July 9th, we learned that the uh, course has joined the Mystic Chamber of Commerce, which allows for some cross-marketing, and people who visit Mystic will be aware of the golf course. Also at that July 9th meet, the land, uh, mm -hmm. meeting, the landscape architects unveiled the master plan for the course. And as we will see some capital improvements in the future, you should know that this is part of a master plan. It's not random improvements to the course. The architect uh, was, did some considerable care to adhere to the original Donald Ross 1916 design. Donald Ross came to America from Scotland as considered the founder of the golf industry in America. Before Ross did his work, uh, Shinney was a, it was a four-hole golf course in 1898, then a six, nine, and 11. At the September 9th meeting, we, dis we discussed uh, getting uh, Shinnecasset, at the clubhouse, listed on the National Register of Historic Places. This wouldn't put any restrictions on it. It would be sort of a, a feather in the cap, something uh, promotional, and it would open the door to grants for historic reconstruction, and it wouldn't uh, put any limits on what we could do. You could tear the place down, and that wouldn't, uh, you're allowed to do that. Property rights are very, very uh, considered paramount in this country. Let's see, the Northeast Golf Magazine rated the course number eight in Connecticut. And uh, let's see, what else do we have here? We'll skip over the, uh, the performance. Uh, they're up to 808 likes on Facebook. They would like 1,000. If you have not already, please, you out there, like, uh, like the Shinnecasset Golf Course. And something of a, an interesting point, as you, may rec as you may know, especially the residents in the city, that they've found a new way to fund the sewer. Previously, sewer charges were paid out of the general tax bill. Now they're shifted to the water bill. Uh, Shinnecasset was, uh, was tax exempt, so they didn't pay property taxes. But we do pay a water bill, which is entirely for the clubhouse and par four. That water bill is now $800 a month, and uh, it, uh, the par four restaurant does not pay the $800. The golf course pays the $800. So they're stuck with, uh, surprised with an $800 water bill. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Representative McDermott, do you have uh, a Nothing. No. Nothing? OK, thank you. Uh, at this point, we're going to move into committee reports, but I'm going to take a five-minute recess. We will reconvene at uh, 5 of 9. Oh, what? Oh, we, uh, I did. I went through it. It was on the agenda. What? Yeah, I did. No, you're not on liaison reports. You're, look at your agenda. Sorry, G. Please. Okay. Yeah, I, I've always given during the liaison report. No, you never have, at least when I've been moderator. Okay, seems to be some confusion. Um, so the Economic Development Commission, like the golf course, does also have a, uh, a Facebook page. So while you're listening to everything else I'm going through, this would be a great time for you to go and like the Groton Economic Development Facebook page. Um, much of the nitty gritty of what economic development does is also sort of in um, Mr. Burt's wheelhouse, so it's in a lot of the, the details about properties and whatnot are in the, um, in the report that he gave. But we did have a great presentation by the Southeast Cultural Coalition, which I want to give you some of the highlights of. Um, so the Southeast Cultural Coalition, if you're not aware, it's a, an organization that brings together a number of for-profit, non-profit arts groups uh, to help them to share resources. It uh, doesn't so much provide, provide financial resources, but it creates efficiencies. They're going to be working with the Beautification Committee to 
um, to help them do things. They basically came and said, how can we help you to make this, to, to bring more art to the area? Um, and they bring those resources together and get, you know, create collaborations. Um, they brought some information to us. The arts spent $168 million in Southeast Connecticut last year. 87 million that is direct people working in the arts and $81 million is spent by the audience coming into town. Um, so $10 million goes back to state and local governments in the form of taxes and the state only spends $5 million uh, on, on arts programs. So it's a pretty good return on investment there. Um, they also mentioned that there were 3.2 million attendees to different arts events during the last year, th two thirds of which are local, but one third of which are coming from out of town. Um, so I thought that was interesting information that you may, be, may like to know about. Uh, they're also working on collaboration efforts with the, the city, the town, New London, and Stonington. And it's always good to see municipalities working together for, for common benefit. Um, and that is all I have of the Economic Development Commission. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry about that. Um, so we're going to take a five minute recess now and we'll reconvene at nine o'clock. Reports now. I don't believe there's a finance report, but we do have a report of Chairman Oliver for Community and Development Services. Special meeting of the RTM Community Development Service Committee was called to order on Wednesday, August 22nd, 2018 at 7.03 p.m. at the Grant Senior Classroom 1 by Chairperson Oliver, committee members present, Rep. Hanscom, Oliver Perry Strode, committee members absent, uh, Reps. McDermott and Newsom. Also in attendance were Reps. Bordelon, Richards, Washington, Wells, Whitehouse, Betsy McCausher, Town Clerk, John Burt, Town Manager, Brian Fango, Attorney from Susan and Shapiro, Paul Gatley, Deputy uh, Chief from Groton Town Police Department, Steve Senegara, Captain from Groton Town Police, Usama Abudawood, Owner, Midnight Hookah Lounge, Ahmed Faraj, Customer of Midnight Hookah Lounge and Resident of Groton. Quorum was declared. Motion was made by Rep. Oliver and seconded by Rep. Hanson for adoption of the ordinance to establish hours of operation for BYB establishments. Shall I read the ordinance? Yes, please. Is that right? No? <clears throat> oh, our, our clerk says you do not have to read okay. it. So. Uh, there was a discussion um, and some of the background on BYOB laws. State law does not regulate BYOB other than stating venues with alcohol licenses may not allow BYOB because it's not covered by state law. Municipalities can create ordinances to regulate it. Legality of regulating. Legislative power with respect to public health and welfare. Wait, could you just slow down a bit? Sure. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Legality of regulating, legislative power with respect to public health and welfare, for example, the municipality's police powers. Connecticut General Statute 7-148 permits municipalities to enact legislation relating to health and welfare. Uh, why regulate? This is a law enforcement issue and BYOB is not regulated. Having an ordinance makes it easier for a police department without a liquor permit and the involvement of the liquor control division issues go to local law enforcement. This is especially an issue for places that aren't serving and taking liability uh, for themselves. Without that liability, the need to train servers and bartenders and chips, training for intervention procedures to know when to cut people off. You're going to have issues if people are going to, there to drink. More BYOB businesses come in, existing ones may change their hours. Rules on hours should be in place based on the safety of our citizens, not based on how late an establishment wants to stay open. Why is it set for one hour before alcohol serving hours end? Most, most bars cut off serving at a certain time so that people have a time to finish up drink and allow time to sober prior to driving. Since BYOB establishments aren't serving or regulated, we are establishing a reasonable cutoff time. <clears throat> most, bar, most bars cut off serving around a half hour before the legal time limit. It is easier for places licensed to serve alcohol to enforce rules since they are the ones serving. The extra half hour for BYOB allows that it may be more difficult to enforce. Was the hookah lounge the impetus behind the ordinance? The lack of BYOB rules first came to the town's attention because of in incidents involving law enforcement at the hookah lounge. The town essentially learned about the larger issue of BYOB not being regulated by the state. Uh, another question was ordinances would affect uh, weddings, meetings, election night, celebrations, etc. Uh, that would run past the pros time. 
No, the ordinance would only affect establishments that are BYOB. Other topics that came up, Midnight Hookah Lounge is open from 6 p.m. to 4 a.m. With, with most business coming in after bars close. U.S. Navy has placed a lounge on a list of banned locations for Navy personnel to attend. Around 10 other BYOB establishments exist in town and are mostly restaurants which close at 10. Voting in favor, Reps Hanscom, Oliver, Perry, Strode, with a recommendation upon passage that town council amend the BYOB ordinance hours to mere regular bar hours. Voting in opposition, none. Abstaining, none. Meeting adjourned at 8.05 p.m. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to accept the minutes? Motion to accept. Uh, a motion to sec second. I see that Doug, Representative Monahan uh, had made a motion and Representative Hanscom uh, seconded it. So we have um, a Point motion, order, sir, please. just let me uh, open up the, uh, no. to discussion. I, I, you seconded it, is that correct, Representative Hanscom? No, 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 I'm saying Okay, I'm we'll sit down for a second, that's fine. Uh, Representative yeah. Adams, okay, sorry. Um, too much motion. Uh, so, Representative Hanscom, uh, we have a motion on the floor, Let everyone, excuse me, um, to accept the minutes. Uh, let's have some discussion on it. Representative Hanscom? Uh, yes, I was present in that meeting, and um, since then, I have done much more research and have talked to um, members of the community, and I feel that at You're this out of order, because we're just discussing the minutes. We're okay, not the discussing not the ordinance. The we're discussing the minutes of a meeting that occurred. Okay, the minutes August. only reflect pro um, ordinance, and that was not just what was discussed. We also had many of us talking about um, the cons, so I just feel like it wasn't represented. And my, um, I, I do not support the ordinance. Okay, is there any other discussion on the minutes? Uh, Representative Bordelon. I was also in attendance at the meeting, and it, it was brought to my attention as well. Uh, at the end of the meeting, I was unsure about how I felt, and I said, mm. Portia, don't jump to the conclusions. Maybe your interpretation is not the correct interpretation. Mm -hmm. But after speaking with fellow... Uh, are the minutes correct, the, the, or are, is there a problem a with the minutes? Excuse me. Not I'm, the meeting, just the minutes. We're I'm talking really about only the discussing minutes. the minutes. I'm discussing the minutes. I'm getting there to tell you exactly what I'm trying to say, please. After speaking with a few other constituents after, three members in particular, they felt that the, th the motion was rushed and that their, their interpretation of what they wanted to vote on was not correctly uh, represented. So I feel that they should have a chance to speak about that if they choose to. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, we're, about. so, uh, you know, if there's, okay, um, let the town clerk speak on this. <coughs> you know, uh, You're not on, I don't think. Okay, the, well, the motion on the floor is to accept the minutes. Um, typically at a meeting, uh, uh, members of a meeting uh, can file a uh, separate um, minority report always. You always have that option. So if you attend a meeting and you don't agree with the minutes, you're a, you are able to file a minority report. And so if you feel slighted, go right ahead and we'll accept that, okay? Representative Newsom, did you have? No. no. Representative Whitehouse? Uh, I was also at that meeting, and um, I, I'm not sure what Representative Bordelon meant to say constituents. I think she meant to say the members of that committee, because I spoke to them afterwards as well, and all three of them indicated to me, and they can confirm this themselves. Okay, that they can file a minority report. We're really only no, amending the minutes. The minutes. The, the minutes is, there a cor is there something yes, there wrong is a with correction. the minutes? It should be one to three, because the three of them did not mean to vote on You can't on the change the vote. Uh, Representative order. Massett? Um, there is a motion. On Use your microphone, please. Sorry. <clears throat> Madam Moderator, there is a motion on the floor that pertains directly to the minutes. Um, and maybe after that motion is voted on, then any other discussion about what happened, didn't happen, interpretations, whatever, can be discussed. That's correct. That is uh, exactly correct. It, it is my belief that what happened in the meeting is what the minutes describe. Is that not correct? Okay. Again, uh, point I, of order. I, I was indicating that something in the minutes has I'm going to accept Vote Representative Massett's minutes. point of order. My point of order is that we need to vote on the minutes before we have discussion. That is correct. Representative Massett is entirely correct on this. Are there any amendments to the minutes to be made? 
we cannot change a vote. If there is a, a disc, as the town clerk uh, said, if there is a difference of opinion, they can file a minority report. So uh, is there any other comments on the minutes of the meeting? The minutes, only the minutes, not the, disc, not the subject matter. No? Seeing none, all in favor of accepting the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? So the minutes uh, are approved. Thank you, Representative Cutter, Oliver, sorry. <laughs> it happens all the time. All right, so we have, um, the minutes have been approved uh, and uh, the uh, committee voted to, uh, not to veto. Um, is there any other motions that, uh, is there a motion that a, another member would like to make at this point in time? Representative Whitehouse. <coughs> Uh, Madam Moderator, I would like to make a motion to uh, to veto this ordinance. And I'd like to briefly go over a couple of reasons why. Of course, there have been a number of reasons. You need a second, <coughs> you need a second before you can speak. Second. Hands come. I think uh, hands come. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. It's the motion's been seconded. You may speak to your motion. Thank now. you. <clears throat> We've heard a number of reasons why this. This ordinance is problematic. Um, we've had a number of citizens of our town come and speak as to why this, this motion is problematic, or why this ordinance, excuse me, is problematic. Basically, we have two choices as an RTM. We can vote yes to veto the ordinance, or we can vote no, and it goes into effect. Very simple. We can't amend it, we can't change it, we can't make recommendations, we can vote yes or no. If we vote yes, it goes back to the council, and the council can, can review it, and put it through a public hearing process again. In that public hearing process, everyone will be aware of what it's going to be about and can appear and we can have a discussion of what the best solutions are to the problems that we have. Now, it has been suggested that I'm, I'm dead set against this ordinance, that I'm, I'm overly impassioned, that I'm, you know, people are wondering why I'm putting so much work in. I'm putting so much work in because a citizen of our town moved here because he loves this town, opened a business, worked long hours to build it with his own hands, and this ordinance will shut it down. And I'm disappointed that people even questioning why I would put that work in. But the major thing is, if we vote no, this is what happens. The ordinance goes into effect. First off, Midnight Hookah will close. That's not a question. It will close. Their main operating hours are from two to four, Saturday and Sunday morning. We can debate if we want to have a late, light, late night lounge. We can debate if we want to have a hookah lounge. But there's no debate as to if they will close. Their business models, they're a late night lounge from two to four, primarily Saturday and Sunday. So the business that he built will close. <clears throat> we will have passed an ordinance that directly led to the closing of a business. People say Connecticut's anti-business, but we don't usually actually put a bullet in the head of a business directly. We usually do it with like, taxes and subtle regulation. The other thing is once they close, young people, as, as uh, Richard said, will find something else to do. They're not just going to go home to bed. It's not, they don't got to work at two. I'm just going to go snuggle up with a good book. They're going to go find something else to do. If we're lucky, they'll simply take their money to Norwich or New London. If we're not lucky, they'll find something else in Groton to do where everything's closed. Um, possibly one of our lovely beaches or or abandoned properties or who knows what else. Maybe they'll go hang out at the uh, the Super 8, I hear that you know, for a small payment per hour, you can get I, a good, good I time. I am there. going to limit everyone to 10 minutes at the very maximum, and I'd ask you to keep your points on your motion. These points are on my motion. Thank you. Um, and on top of that, we open ourselves to potential civil suit because the demographics of the business is being affected. So a lot of people said, why, why haven't the other BYOB businesses complained? They haven't complained because they're not being affected. There is one business this will directly, imp directly impact and cause to close. There's others who may get a fine if somebody gives a mimosa to their 20-year-old brother or Please something. don't be derogatory. Please keep your points on I'm, I'm the issue. I'm sorry, I don't understand hand. how I'm being derogatory. Just, 
No, could you explain so I can not be derogatory again? You've just done it several times. I'm trying to point Get out. Get a moderator point of order, decorum. Right. I had meant to say okay. that there is a, uh, needs to be a much more greater level of decorum and respect in this body, and that's why I'm trying to slow you down. We, we have, unfortunately, we have, you know, an issue where people are not always respectful of each other. And I was asked to say something, and I should have said it at the beginning of the meeting, and now I'm saying it. So keep your I, thank tone you for your opinion. and your words respectful. So there's one business this will directly affect. It's not going to profoundly affect Ford's. It's not going to profoundly affect Abbott's. It's not going to profoundly affect any of the other daytime BOBs. It will shut down one business. And that will give them, potentially, Sandy for legal action. And even if not, they're still going to leave. They're still going to shut down a business. People are going to know that as a town, we killed a business with an ordinance, knowing, and we did not give them their chance to express themselves. The town council knew not, they weren't targeting the business, but they were aware of the existence of business and they were aware of their hours, if not their business model. And so if we vote no, we're gonna be shutting them down without anyone having reached out to them. None of the town councilors reached out. The town manager didn't reach out. The chief didn't reach out. Nobody spoke to him directly and he didn't know about it, when I finally contacted Mr. Budawad, it was because I was trying to research this because I knew it was going to come up, and I assumed that he knew about it, so I wanted to get his opinion on how it affect his business. And he was very surprised to hear about it. He'd never heard about it before. So that's why I ended up having to, having to explain it to him. And my concern is that we, we will be killing a business without having even given the owner the courtesy of a phone call and I actually would be curious to hear, because um, I believe Councillor Franco will be speaking soon, uh, and I believe that she was the sponsor of this motion, and spoke to a number of other BYOBs. I'd be curious to hear why she was not able to find the time to make a phone call or reach out to uh, Mr. Budawad or the business. I'm sure she didn't know who he was at the time, but why she wasn't able to, to engage with him and find out how this would affect his business, since the hours would clearly be curtailed. But, my, my final point is, as I said, with the choice of yes or no, you can vote any way you want. But I just want people to understand very clearly that if, after your name is called and you vote no, you are voting to shut down Mr. Boudouad's business, a business that he built with his own hands after he moved here because he loves this town. He lived in Bridgeport, he owned a business, he visited, he fell in love with the town, he moved his family here, his children go to Fitch High School, and he decided he wanted to, own a, wanted to run a business here as well. And we will be telling him that his business is not welcome here in the model that it operates under. And I would interpret that as saying that he's not welcome here and his clientele are not welcome here. They should go to Norwich, they should go to New London, they should go somewhere else because we don't want, and I actually heard, I heard someone say, we don't want that kind of business here. Point of order, Madam Moderator. Decorum. Accepted. Please, this is the third warning. I'm going to have to ask you to sit and then the next uh, direction will be to leave the meeting if you can't be more respectful. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we have a motion on the floor. It is a motion to veto by the charter. This has to have two-thirds vote of the RTM with 41 members. That is 28 uh, votes. Uh, in favor of it, which is needed to uh, carry that veto. I want to also, again, reiterate that people are to speak respectfully and have a decorum in, in all their um, comments on this, okay? Uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Councillor Franco, who had her hand up quite a while ago, to come and uh, speak to this issue. Thank you. Good evening, RTM. I would like to begin by thanking you for the service you provide for, for Groton. So I would like to start by stating categorically that this ordinance is not about one establishment. This ordinance is about the public welfare and safety of Groton citizens, along with the setting a standard for current and future BYOBs. 
As the final step in this ordinance process, this now sits with you. I have heard various opinions from people on why they should or should not pass an ordinance. From my own research, there are six main functions of a law. Keep the peace, shape moral, value, moral standards, promote social justice, facilitate orderly change, provide basis for compromise, and lastly, to help facilitate a plan. I believe the ordinance you are reviewing is covered in these functions. Let me quickly describe how this ordinance came about. I received a complaint from a citizen regarding a BYOB establishment. Sometime later, I went on a ride along with the Groton Police Department and asked the sergeant about this establishment. I also asked questions regarding how a BYOB works in Groton. From there, I did a lot of research on BYOBs, learned a lot, and will share the information with you in this letter. I also had conversations with the town manager, Chief Fazaro, town clerk, town planner, counselors, local BYOB establishments, and citizens. I then brought the idea of the ordinance to the town council and town manager with their approval. The town attorney drafted an ordinance. The council debated in the committee of the whole. I announced this ordinance at all meetings that I attended as a liaison, so many would be aware. We had a public hearing. We then passed the ordinance at the town council. So here we stand with the BYOB ordinance before you. During my research, I learned the term BYOB first came about in the 1970s as a means for patrons to bring a bottle of wine to a restaurant. Over time, it has evolved to include other alcoholic beverages and, es and establishments, but is most common in the restaurant industry. Our neighboring states have all addressed it in some fashion, whether it's through state statute or allowing local municipalities to adopt their own regulations. I'd now like to answer some questions about the fundamentals of the ordinance. So what are the differences between a BYOB versus a licensed liquor establishment? All, everything that I will read here is related to a licensed regulated liquor establishment. A BYOB does not have to abide by any of these. They must apply for a liquor license, which is a 19-page application with applicable fees from $1,500 to $2,400. Do a thorough background check of the permittee and the owner. Liquor applicant must notify the residents of a town that a liquor license is being applied for with rights of citizens to object and to be heard at a hearing with the liquor commission. Trained staff, education and training for the responsible service, sale and consumption of alcohol. Mandated hours of operation. Compliance infractions. Punishment is usually a number of days that the establishment establishment must close and be unable to sell liquor, as well as monetary fines, possibly in the thousands of dollars, and sending the licensee to alcohol seller and server training. Most cases fall into two categories, sale of alcohol to a minor under the age of 21 and sale of alcohol to somebody already intoxicated. So excessive compliance infractions could lead to revocation of a liquor li license. And with that, I had sent to you, a, all of you, a application, which is 19 pages long, for a liquor license. It's not a very simple thing to get. Should the hours of a BYOB be the same as a licensed establishment? Licensed liquor establishments announce last call and will have all drinking ceased and patrons out of their establishments and closed at the mandatory cl closing hours implemented by the State of Connecticut Liquor Commission. A BYOB, as stated above, does not have to comply with any regulations, training, nor consequences. Even though this ordinance states a BYOB must cease intake of alcohol at a proposed time, that does not mean they must close the business, such as a licensed establishment is required to. I personally believe a BYOB hasn't earned the same allowances as a licensed establishment. Therefore, the allowed alcohol times should not be equal. Though the town council debated on start and stop times and set midnight cease times for each night, then subsequently increased Friday and Saturday evenings by an hour. I believe the hours set are reasonable for our community. Why weren't all BYOBs notified of this ordinance? When a BYOB registers their business in Groton, they are not asked nor required to state that they are a BYOB. The only way to find a BYOB in Groton is to search the internet, for which I, the list I found was not a complete listing. It's not feasible to think every single BYOB could have been notified. Was the hookah lounge the basis behind the ordinance? The lack of BYOB rules first came to my attention because of a citizen's complaint due to incidences involving law enforcement at the hookah lounge. Though the BYOB ordinance is not about that one establishment, this ordinance is about the lack of regulation and oversight, safety factors, and setting a standard for our community. The ordinance allows police to use discretion. Shouldn't the ordinance be more concrete? 
I beg to differ. Please use discretion daily. The definition of police discretion is a vague term that is appropriately vague definition. It is defined as the decision-making power afforded to police officers that allows them to decide if they want to pursue police procedure or simply let someone off with a warning. Example, you're pulled over for a broken taillight. The police officer, under his discretion, gives you a written warning or verbal warning instead of a ticket. How many incidences have we had at a BYOB? Most citizens in Groton will not know if there is an incident at BYOB. The Liquor Commission will not investigate incidences within 24 hours after police contact, such as they would for various <clears throat> assaults, murder, drugs, underage drinking, or continued drinking by intoxicated BYOB pat patrons, as they would in a licensed facility, along with the local police. A Groton BYOB incident investigation is left to the local police department. Rarely will you see an article in the newspaper, and the local police do not publish them. Nor do the police logs in the newspaper say where an arrest was made. For regulated businesses, the Liquor Commission holds an open investigation and hearings for public access, and at times you will read about them in the newspaper along with the Liquor Commission's penalties. What do other Groton citizens think about the BYOB? During my research, I spoke about this ordinance to numerous average citizens who are not involved in the political process. At one event, I spoke to a group of approximately 30 people, both Republican, Democrat, and a Libertarian between the ages of 30 and 50, where I simply read the original ordinance without bias or opinion. First, they questioned why was, it, why was the town doing this? Wasn't there already a state law? Upon hearing there was no state law, the group, minus the Libertarian who didn't want any laws, thought it was a common sense ordinance. The consensus was they didn't want establishments open all hours of the day and night, allowing people to drink without any regulations in their town. Who has endorsed ordinances of this type? The Groton Alliance for Substance Abuse Prevention. In the list I sent out, I, re I removed the two state ones because we were having a disagreement over the word endorsement or support. So I removed those. What will happen if the, endorse, if, the, if the ordinance doesn't pass? Well, no one can predict the future, though the town has received inquiries regarding our BYOB regulations. If Groton attracts other BYOB establishments who would like to stay open late into the morning hours, this will put a strain on the police overnight shift and further police patrolling will be needed during that shift. In closing, I hope, you, I hope I've answered some of your questions. What is in the best interest of Groton, Connecticut and our citizens is now in your hands. And I thank you for your time and energy you took looking into this ordinance. Thank you, uh, Representative uh, Councilor Franco. Uh, I, I saw some hands up before, but can, if you can raise your hands, because I, I saw Representative Monahan. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I have a question for Chief Fasaro. Uh, Chief, we received, the RTM received uh, an email that had, uh, I guess it was a response that the department made to the day's uh, FOI uh, request. And one of the attachments was this events by location list. It's a data point, but it's a data point without context. And I'm wondering, um, you know, you can pick out on this events at location the arrests that were attached to those enclosures, but there's a lot of, uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, is this, I, I don't know, would you have a similar list of the Dunkin' Donuts at, you know, Route no. 12 or some other place? How much of this is routine just checking businesses versus problems? Well, what you have before you in the, the document, and I believe this is what you're talking about, correct? That's generated by our computer-rated computer dispatch screen. We have, I know I've briefed the, the council and the RTM in the past about the fact that we have, an R, we have a records management system, which is separate and apart from our computer-rated dispatch system. They're not intertwined. But this, this shows when our officers went to this particular location. Uh, that was a request we received by the New London Day. Uh, this is our response to it. As you can see, there's a variety of different codes that go into that under the call type, patrol check, which means officers responded there for some reason. It's not descriptive, doesn't say they responded to it because um, it, it could be a variety of reasons. Uh, you can see a little bit uh, difference in there. For example, motor vehicle complaint, um, motor vehicle stops. Um, I believe that there's some larcenies, uh, suspicious activity. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of different things. This is where we responded to that location for some reason. Uh, I apologize, it's not more descriptive, but it's a system that we have in place. That's what, what the dispatchers input into it when the officer goes there. Now if there's a resolution to it, it may come out differently if a report is written. Um, 
but this is what we were asked to provide. I don't know if that clear does that. Well, you're looking. How, how would I don't know? You know how, how you can compare it to another business entity. I mean, um, for example, I don't know, the flagship hotel. Sure. Do they have a similar call list or uh, some other? Yeah, there's, there's, you know, the, wherever we respond, for instance, if we respond to a house for an alarm, that would have, you know, the list of how many times we went to that house for an alarm or for a disturbance. Um, if we went to another business, we would have a similar list. Uh, if you're asking for me to compare and contrast how this effect, this is compared to other places, I can tell you our midnight shift responds to this location quite frequently. So this reflects that it's a higher number of responses than other businesses in the town. I think that's a fair statement. Okay. No, maybe not all, but certainly some. Representative Massett. Madam Moderator, just um, a procedural question. Representative um, Whitehouse made a motion. The motion was seconded. Just refresh my memory. Did we vote on that, or was there some reason not to vote on We're it? We're having our discussion on the motion right now. Okay. Representative Bordelon. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, uh, where do I begin with this? Could, could, could I, I just want to uh, have uh, the town clerk speak. So no, you will speak sorry, next. I, sorry. You know, I should have, uh, should have gotten her attention quicker. <clears throat> but um, I just want to remind, <clears throat> excuse me, members of the RTM that, uh, uh, that and the charter does speak to conflict of interest, 3.5.3 on page 3 of our town charter. And there is an... There is a statute, I mean, the statute also works with this too, but it speaks to any appointed official member uh, of any board or commission, town employee, um, that uses their official position or office or fails to take or take action to influence others or to take or fail or take action in a manner which he or she has reason to believe. <clears throat> I can go on, but there's a direct um, <clears throat> question whether any of our members um, have either a, gone into uh, any of our BOIOB establishments without um, paying cover charge or, you know, that might be construed as a, a conflict of interest. I say this because Representative uh, Whitehouse did tell me that he had gone to the Midnight Hookah Lounge and, what, and wasn't and didn't pay for a cover and I thought that was un, a little questionable. But I would like you to uh, all um, consider uh, if you if you have a violation. May I answer that? Sure. Uh. So, as part of my duties as a member of the RTM, I visited the Midnight Hookah Lounge, uh, as did a number of other representatives, and I was not there to partake. I was not there as a as a participant, I wasn't there to enjoy myself, I was there to observe. And so they allowed me to enter without paying the normal $15 cover. It was not a favor. I was exhausted up until four in the morning. It wasn't something I did for fun. Um, they, they were allowing me to fulfill my duties as a member of the RTM. It was not a gift or an enticement or, or anything else that would create a conflict of interest. I'd like to refer this to the Ethics Committee, if that's possible. We don't, yeah, as soon as we have one. Yeah, we don't, we don't have one. Oh, <laughs> oh, so for much of the charter. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, are you implying that I've, I've committed a breach of ethics? Mm -hmm. yes. that, yeah, it is it's in the charter that Betsy just, that uh, the town clerk just read. And so any other, any other, uh, any other representative who did so would have also committed a breach of ethics? If you get, if, as it says here, uh, no elected or appointed official member of any town or town employee shall accept gifts or services or other items from any person or entity currently doing business with the town except those of neg negligible intrinsic value. If a police officer were to enter Minnehuka, would they be required to pay to avoid a Conflict. I was fulfilling my duties, as was Representative Streeter, Representative Bordelon, and any other representatives who visited. Representative Streeter, 
you may sit now try to be Biden's. very polite about this I did go to the hooker lounge <coughs> on two occasions I did not enter the hooker lounge I did not go inside I was offered to go inside however I did not I stood outside and talked to you did not go inside you and I will discuss that later I'm trying to be nice about it but I did not go inside thank you nice representative Bordelon and at the minimum let me just say you must disclose if this is the case you need to disclose any financial uh, conflicts of interest and then you know there the next step is if you should be recused from speaking or voting on this representative Bordelon I also attended the hookah lounge but I attended before the cover charge was starting the cover charge started at a certain time uh, once that was for the DJ. So I did attend, and I didn't have to leave when the cover charge started. So I actually did attend. I attended with my fiance, and I was able to go in before the hookah lounge was charging. I went Thank earlier you. because that's what I deem fit. But I'd like to speak, if, may Please I speak do. now? Um, so I did attend, but before the charging uh, uh, time. Um, I guess where I stand on this, I was doing my due diligence as well, and I wanted to look into this. I hear that it, people are saying, has it been targeted or not? To me, it's a point of it came to light because of an incident, and now an ordinance is being created. And one of the incidents happened to be at the hookah lounge. When I asked how come nobody has went to this establishment, or how come the gentleman was not, the owner was not invited to the public hearing, I was told, as stated by uh, Councillor Franco, that we do not have a system where we identify all of our BYOB ordinances. At some points, I was also told that the owner had lawyered up and they couldn't really engage, which I can understand. But all of this was, didn't happen before that had happened. And we knew that this establishment was going to be affected because we, we had an incident that occurred there. So I feel that the process could have been done correctly. Am I against the ordinance? I'm, I'm against the ordinance as it is written, not as an ordinance in general. I feel as a town representative here and as a community member and as a resident uh, that if we're gonna enact ordinances or put forth some type of law or change, we need to do the full process. And that would be to do all the checks and balances to even, if you don't feel that you could meet the owner, um, let's just say there was another establishment that you didn't want to go in or didn't feel that that was something you were interested in, we have the obligation to at least address it and maybe meet for a cup of coffee outside the establishment and invite and give the owner the dignity and the respect to speak at the center table to the council at the public hearing. And this did not happen and he was not properly notified. I also feel that um, the, the way in which this is being represented and how it came to be is, um, is very tough to understand and it is, there's parts of it that are still unanswered in my opinion. There's a lot of places here in Groton that have tons of problems. We've had murders up and down the strip. We've had other things going on here. Just because a place is TIP certified to serve alcohol doesn't mean that they're abiding by the rule. One hopes but that doesn't mean that they're, they aren't, or not drinking in the parking lot. I understand that there is an increase of policing at the place. I saw it myself. There was no disturbance going on. There was just two officer cars parked at the mobile, kind of sur you know, surveying the, system, the area, uh, making sure it was a safe place to be. So I question some of the, the calls on here. Are these also just you know, kind of courtesies because you had a problem? My, my problem with the ordinance is that we're supposed to be encouraging TIF in this town and encouraging new businesses to come in. Just because this is a business that we do, we do not necessarily agree with doesn't make it wrong, just because we will not partake in it. If you don't eat seafood, you might not like a certain restaurant. Just because we don't smoke hookah or we don't want to hang out and go to a DJ at those hours, that, that's our choice, but it shouldn't be taken away as a right. This man put forth a plan to have this place, everything passed through, one incident occurs, it come, or, or whatever, two, comes to light, and now we're slapping an ordinance. What I'd like to see in this town is to go, go to the, the owner and show good communication and um, continuity and working together first. Come up with a plan, set some, 
some limitations. And then if that doesn't work, then you'll have all that paperwork to show and then put forth an ordinance. I don't feel like that was done here. And that's what I would like to see. So what I encourage is that this, get, this is vetoed and it goes back to the town council, not to necessarily make it go away per se, but to re-look at it and do the due diligence and give the proper respect to the proper individuals that are involved. At the town council meeting, I know that it was stated at the meeting that they had went to Ford's Lobster because originally the ordinance was going to go from 11 to midnight and the mimosas at Ford's Lobster would be affected. They moved it to 10. I also spoke at that meeting about my concern and thinking that it should fo follow the bar hours. And they did, I believe, uh, uh, Councillor Heed spoke and said, made a motion and they, they discussed it. They broke for a minute and uh, recessed and came back and moved it um, to the hours that are currently stated in the, in the current ordinance. <laughs> I feel as we're doing this, we're, we're, we're on the right track, I think, but I feel that we need to relook at this in a way where we, 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 ha we come to a table, come to an agreement, and not make it such the powers that be. I encourage you know, the, the, the police officers in this town, I, I respect what they do and, and how they come forward and are doing their job, but the, pace, the police does look a little staked out at times. I mean, I've driven by several times. There's cops out there all the time. There's no disturbance going on. There's other establishments in this town where there's noise complaints, downtown Mystic. I've, I've drove by there and sat out there at night. People, no one's sitting out in front of those establishments. I just, I just would like to see this establishment to get the fair representation and, and send this back and give them the shot that they deserve. Let them come to the center table of discussion in front of the council, not from the podium at the town council meeting under the public citizen section, and then say, okay, your time is up. So once again, I encourage, you know, I thank, I thank the council for their hard work with this, but I, I, I cannot support this in the sense that it, it, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. I think we're almost there. I would like to see this follow the bar hours and I could support this uh, ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to note one uh, thing that the town clerk had mentioned, which is that if this uh, veto does not um, uh, prevail in the final vote, that there is the opportunity using the power initiative for the RTM to develop an amendment to that ordinance. Is that correct? So I just want to put that out there as a third path. Representative Bailey. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, I have a question for uh, the town clerk as far as regarding violations of conflict of interest. Would it be possible that for any situation considering that uh, be brought up uh, to the Rules and Procedures Committee of the RTM? Certainly, I think that could be uh, could be discussed in rules and procedures since we don't actually have a um, an ethics commission yet for the town of Groton, although there is a resolution establishing one in front of the council. So. Thank you, Ma uh, Madam Clerk. If, if that happens, then all conflict questions would go to the commission. All right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, regarding back to the uh, our current affairs here for the discussion. I don't feel that this uh, ordinance is picking on any business. Um, it's establishing a guideline for uh, all businesses to operate under. And we do need a starting point somewhere. Uh, anything else that would come out of it, businesses can present themselves for citizen petitions either by in person or in writing. But I think this is a good place, a good starting point, just to have everything as a baseline in order to keep everything under control. So there is no question about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Representative McDermott. Thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, I have a couple of questions and, uh, that have come up after all of the discussion. This is really a pretty unique situation that we have here in town. Um, I'm not aware of any other places, not having visited any, in other cities, of course, but I'm wondering what other towns like New London do, Norwich, towns that are of comparable size. Uh, uh, LJ, uh, do you have any idea what uh, they do up in Norwich, for instance? I'm not aware of any other similar situations. If you're asking service. Do, do you think they, ha I mean, do, as far as their BYOB hours are concerned? I, I don't know. I can't speak for any other municipality. I, I, I'm not aware of anything. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, 
I too visited the uh, hookah lounge after a movie with my wife. We went up about 10.30. There was nobody there. And uh, I spoke with the owner, and we had a nice conversation, pretty much uh, as you would with anybody. He was uh, kind of uh, interested in, in the whole ordinance thing, of course, and wanted to know what my feelings were. I told him I really didn't know at that point in time, but that I wanted to uh, just drop by because I felt it was my obligation to do that. Uh, whether there was a cover charge or not, I have no idea. There was nobody there, and I understand that most of the business occurs after midnight or around 2 o'clock. Uh, so whether I'm in violation of anything, I have no idea. Okay, no cover before 2, so I guess I'm good. But, you know, if we ever had the thought that what we do here doesn't affect anybody, this is sure a wake-up call for that, isn't it? Uh, I'm not sure what, what we should do on this thing, to be honest with you. Uh, I would like to know what other towns do. That would be my uh, one thought, I think, that I would like to throw out there. Representative Powers. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, I just have a statement that I'd like to read, and then I have a question for our town attorney who so kindly showed up tonight. Um, as a body, the RTM is, uh, we're going to be voting on an ordinance, uh, and it regulates BYOB, not hookah. And for those that, I don't know, I, I had to look up what hookah was, which is, it's defined as an oriental tobacco pipe with a long flexible tube which draws the smoke through water contained in a bowl. So in the old days, they called it a bong. <laughs> okay. We do have smoking laws in place that regulate secondhand smoke and the spread of cancer. And that comes under public health and safety, I believe. Um, and this, this ordinance, you know, it's, it's regulating something called the consumption of alcohol, which licensed facilities has to have. And that's, that in itself is a public health issue that all of us need to be concerned about. And I believe that's what the RTM is here to do, is to make our community what we believe it should be. And public safety and public health are both issues that are their primary concerns. The state of Connecticut has left each and every town with the ability to regulate their own town with this ordinance or this type of ordinance for any type of BYOB. This not only is going to regulate the existing businesses, but any future businesses that are coming into our town. And it also, if we have an ordinance in place, we have some form of relief from liability. Because if there is none, it's all going to fall back on the shoulders of the town. So those are the things that I considered when, when thinking about what we're going to vote upon here. Um, the question I have is for the town attorney. I'm sure that he spent enough time on the ordinance, and I believe that it covers the basis of what we're looking for to have some type of regulation to BYOBs. And I don't think we're picking on any business. I think what we're regulating <coughs> is the consumption of alcohol, and I think that that's paramount that we understand that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I'm Brian Fiango. Attorney Fiango, <laughs> how much time did you spend on writing this? I'm, I'm just curious to know. And what did you use as a basis to write this document? I mean, did you use uh, sister communities? Did you look at other towns? I mean, how did we come up with the ordinance and you know the definitions and all the different things? Could you explain that to the body for us, please? Yeah, I don't have like an, an, an hourly uh, total calculated for the for drafting it. It didn't take um, that long. There were a lot of options. There were um, uh, the model for our ordinance was from a Pennsylvania municipality. Uh, there were a lot of options that were far more complicated than this, where there's a whole licensing scheme for the business, where uh, there's a lot of uh, hoops to jump through before they actually get the ability. Uh, within the municipality, for example, in Pennsylvania, there were uh, some towns that had that. There were fees associated with it, and then you had the more the the um, I guess the simpler terms, which this was modeled after, that just had uh, basically an hours uh, limit uh, for the by uh, byob. So it didn't take that long. It was modeled after uh, a more simplistic approach from another municipality, um, and then 
there's been time uh, spent afterwards just uh, sort of dealing with some of the questions that have come up. Thank you very much. Yeah. Representative Mello Miller. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Um, I want to say for the record, I have smoked hookah in my early 20s and back where I uh, lived before I moved and made Connecticut my home. My early 20s, I would, before I could drink, before the age of 21, I would spend many late nights in a hookah lounge and I enjoyed it. Um, it is not similar to a bong, it's more smoking a cigarette and it's more citrusy, but you can choose a flavor. And it's actually very lovely as a way of maybe if you don't drink to just kind of relax, but you are still smoking. So that's just for whatever any information. But Chief Vizarro, I had a couple of questions for you. So first of all, if this ordinance is vetoed tonight, how is this going to affect your coverage, what do you foresee happening on your end? I see, well, first of all, I, I think it's important to point out the police department takes a position that's about public safety, right? And, and uh, I think Councilor Franco went over a lot of facts that pertain to this as far as enforcement. Um, our officers are very proactive when it comes to DUI enforcement. Uh, we, I, I anticipate and can see through the numbers that I've gotten recently that, that not attributing this to any particular business, but our numbers for DUI enforcement have gone up, meaning our officers have made more arrests. There's also the index we look at, which is accidents, uh, fatal accidents. We, unfortunately, this town has had some of those. We had a four-year-old little girl died in a DUI-related accident not that long ago, as you probably recall. Um, so, you know, we have to dedicate resources where we have issues. You know, in, in police work, we call it cops on dots. So if there's more response to certain locations, we put more resources towards that. Um, a, a couple of years ago, we had, uh, when I first came here as chief, we had a dedicated uh, uh, patrol that was set out to, to patrol bars in the town. Uh, because back, you know, 15, 20 years ago, there was more bars, there was more activity, our officers responded there a lot more, so we had a dedicated patrol for that. Uh, based on budgets, we've reduced that. We no longer have that dedicated patrol. I'd probably look at reinstituting it if, if there's more activity that our officers are seeing uh, you know when they respond to locations when they make an arrest that ties them up for hours uh, we need additional people out there on the streets um, again you know I'm, I'm really looking this this particular issue is public safety you know we regulate very closely the laws pertaining to liquor licenses as you've heard before um, there aren't a lot of rules here and, and we're asking our officers to go out and enforce something that doesn't exist can I ask a follow-up question sure so with you seeing the need for extra coverage, could you foresee in the next budget cycle requesting more officers? Yeah, potentially, potentially. I mean, that, it, it's attributed to a bunch of different factors, but if we see accidents go up, if we see DOIs go up, our officers are obviously busier. There's more activity, so there's always that potential. And then one more question. Um, can you give me a nominative idea of a typical establishment in that area um, I know you don't have the numbers in front of you, and I know this is, you know, from Freedom of Information, but I, I know that you mentioned to Representative Monaghan that, that this is a, on higher on average, but is this an area I know that the police officers patrol anyway, so is it, is this area patrolled, I guess, at a, a higher rate, would, yeah, you, we, would you say? We have, di we have distinct patrol areas within our patrol structure. Um, you know, the Route 12 corridor from the sub base up through uh, Paquanic Bridge is a is a busier area. It's a main thoroughfare. There's a lot of businesses, you know, bars, restaurants, um, retail. We respond to a lot of places for for uh, larcenies, retail thefts along the Route 12 corridor. Um, you know, and I, I what I did do is I broke down where we get the preponderance of our our DUI activity. And there, there's there's you know in the areas here we've seen increases in DUI activity. And again, that's not attributed to any one business. It's attributed to the fact that there are other establishments and people traverse the Route 12 corridor for a variety of reasons, and our officers, as I said from the outset, are very proactive in DUI enforcement. They, they make a lot of arrests. Last year, our officers made 142 arrests for DUI in calendar year 2017. Uh, we're on pace to surpass that this year. So um, I, I, I hope that addresses your question. I hope that gives you the answer that you, you were looking for. Well, well, maybe not what I was looking for, but what, what maybe perhaps is needed. So from just to, to recap for my own information, so you have seen an increase in the area since? 
I, I see statistical data here that tells me from, uh, I had broke it down six months increments for, for the town as a whole from uh, July 1st of 2017 to December 31st, we had 72 DUI arrests. Uh, for the first half of this year, uh, we had 70 and, and we've got in the first two months of uh, this, since July, we've had 39. So we're on a pace to be at a higher average. Thank you. Thank you. Other, other folks? Representative Newsom. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Chief, how will this be enforced? I beg your pardon? How will this be enforced? How will this be enforced? It's an infraction, um, uh, much like a traffic ticket. It's a, uh, it, it's a fine. It's not an in-custody arrest. It's uh, based on a town ordinance. We're able to do it on, on, a, on a state infraction. Uh, there is an avenue of recourse where people who want to plead not guilty can have their hearing sometime in the future uh, in, in um, uh, the Superior Court. But if... Uh if you go into an establishment, assuming that this ordinance is passed, and you see somebody who is drinking past the time period, do they get the ticket and the business or just the person? I believe drinking? as the ordinance is written, and I'll defer to counsel on this, I believe it's open to either party, if I'm not, correct, if I'm not mistaken. So it could be either or both. Okay, thank you. I, I just wanna say, my concern is that we, we heavily regulate the sale of alcohol in this state because it's a big responsibility. Um, past experience has shown, this is why you know, we have so many laws, this is why bars pay money. The difference between an after hours establishment, let's say, or BYOB or whatever you wanna say, the difference is that with a bar, somebody that who is a problem and has repeated causes repeated issues and is shown to be not responsible, they can go and have their liquor license revoked by the state, and then they're out of business. The problem with BYOBs is there is no there is no recourse in this town or the state uh, if an owner is not doing what they should be doing if they're not being responsible. I'm not saying this owner is not responsible. I'm talking about in general. We have, and uh, although people want to make it about one business, it's not going to be one business. It'll, it'll be other businesses. And the, the way the ordinance is written, there are other, there are other businesses. Um, so I think we need to, to think about that very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Pasqualini. Thank you, Madam Moderator. My question is, and I'm not happy with the process, and I, and I understand a possible need, but I also look at it as the town trying to defend something. Uh, as the town attorney said, you looked at something in, in Pennsylvania, so there's no ordinance or laws anywhere in the state of Connecticut, I'm gathering. There was, uh, there was a, um, an ordinance that was drafted and went through the initial processes in Hamden. Um, we found it from looking uh, through sort of uh, Yahoo Google, Google search for that purpose and had a, a, a more extensive uh, regulatory scheme in it with um, uh, permitting fees associated with permitting and things of that nature. But, uh, I'm not aware of um, towns outside of that. Uh, just as a caveat on that one, that the Hamden one um, didn't go all the way through at some point because uh, one or two of the businesses um, or one of the two of the issues that were coming up had sort of resolved, uh, resolved themselves. Okay. But there are, I, I would say that we didn't spend a ton of time looking at states outside uh, and looking at all of them in particular. Um, but, uh, you know, but that was one Connecticut municipality that, that had drafted one. So we don't know, we don't know if we're the first, our, our other communities? I don't know that. I don't know that. Looking to us to see what we're, we're doing. Um, and how would we defend arbitrarily coming up with times instead of just sticking with the state liquor laws regarding bars? Wouldn't we be safer staying with those times? 
to be able to back that up if somebody goes to contest it in court since uh, there is no history or anything and how did you come up with these times we check with Fords to see if it would hurt them and we changed the time that just doesn't seem to fly if we're looking for something that's going to hold up in court so the law the uh, law enforcement purpose uh, drove the drove the time uh, determinations and with respect to um, uh, you had referred to them you know arbitrarily it, it, it came from uh, some determinations from law enforcement as, as to what would be necessary and proper uh, but I would say that the police powers that uh, are, are really the originating legislation which allows towns to do ordinances like this uh, really are a blank slate if it, if it addresses public policy so uh, you want to put some reasoning uh, behind it you want to uh, get input from from local law enforcement that's going to uh, have to regulate uh, the issue uh, but uh, poli the police powers that the town has for ordinances like this is, is uh, very broad very broad and, and it's really up to uh, the town that uh, to draft something that works for them I don't know if the chief wants to add on the time. <coughs> Yeah, we were, we were consulted on this as far as times. Um, I understand what your point is about the the, uh, the, the bar hours, so to speak. Uh, we had some lengthy discussion. I know the co council, when they passed the ordinance at their level, actually revised it. Uh, part of our concerns was being able to enforce it, the enforceability of it. If someone brings in a cooler with their own alcohol, you know, when do they have time to get it out? Are they going to claim that officers are unjustly um, uh, issuing tickets or asking them to remove that at the strike of two o'clock. Uh, this gives a little bit of a buffer time. It allows our officers uh, to, to enforce it properly. It gives a little bit of a, um, it accounts for the fact that in a liquor establishment that is licensed and regulated and there, as has been pointed out, are fines attached and all that kind of stuff, it, they have to be closed by the times they're, they're closed, right? Officers can go in there. If they're operating after the time it was supposed to close, there are fines attached to it. Our officers can do a liquor referral. They can send something to the Liquor Control Commission. Um, so there are definitely consequences. This provides a little bit of a, um, uh, a buffer for our officers to go in there. As was uh, pointed out earlier, typically bar time is not true time, meaning the bars want to make sure that people are not drinking and consuming alcohol at the strike of 1 o'clock or 2 a.m. Uh, when the state says they have to be done with it. You know, they, they start turning the lights on earlier, they stop serving alcohol, consume their last drink, uh, so that by the time that, that, that hour strikes, that they don't run any risk of any consequences. You know, they're trying to clean it up before uh, that hour. Uh, you know, there, there were several things that we were consulted on. Um, we did discuss this, uh, myself and some members of my staff talked to counselors that had questions about it, talked to the town attorney, the town manager. Um, that seem to be reasonable because in reality it does somewhat correlate with the bar closing time when you account for those other um, other time variances, the bar time, the stopping of service. Um, but you know, our other concern has been all along here is are people leaving those businesses where the bars have closed to say let's go somewhere else where we continue drinking. Um, you know, and I've I've had that conversation with people here. I've I've talked about it with many. Uh, individuals, including some of our officers, uh, officials here in the town, who, who do believe and reasonably believe that people are driving to get to this to a, a location after they've been drinking somewhere else. So that 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 is a public safety concern, especially when we're extending hours for uh, two, three hours and allowing people to bring their own intoxicants with them. Um, that I think that should be a concern. That should be the overwhelming sentiment uh, of of our elected bodies to say we want, we want to protect people. We want to protect the roads. We want to make it safe. We don't want people traversing the roads of Groton, getting into accidents, getting arrested. We'd like to prevent that. We'd like to reduce that risk. Is that, you know. Representative Rogers. Um, thank you. I just had one of my uh, questions answered, and that was primarily um, regarding the the safety of, of how a uh, midnight or 1 a.m. closure was safer than a 2 a.m. closure. I guess my follow-up question there is if um, the law in the books for liquor establishments is 2 a.m., we haven't mandated anything to tell them to turn on their lights at 1.30. It seems artificial for us to put a midnight or a 1 a.m. Uh, buffer 
on these establishments. Um, but no follow-up question regarding that. Um, I do have a follow-up question. Um, I, I think it's most appropriate for the town council, but I'll open it to anyone, and that is, um, were there other uh, mechanisms discussed, such as requiring the BO, BYOB establishments to require safety training? Um, similar to the tip training that a liquor establishment would have, other ways to promote public safety um, that are that are not included in this bill. Well, we had. Uh, I, I, is that on? Can I hear? It sounds like it's on. <laughs> um, uh, we had, as we had the initial review done by our attorney, um, over options, that, and he went into you know there are more stringent options out there that we could take there are less and we discussed with him different options out there and um, and even other laws and other ways is there other ways to get at it and uh, it was thought that the main thing is adding in for public safety wise that it's best to not have people continuing on drinking past a certain hour that was the, the overriding concern and that we could add you know let's see how that how that works and if that doesn't work we could always amend and add other regulations later so. Oh, um, Mayor uh, Granitowski, sorry. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I feel like I should have a giant budget book in front of me here. Um, I think what we've been trying to do as a council is, um, if, you, if you look at the noise ordinance that um, people had requested, and when we studied that and we looked into it and we had the chief look into things and they priced um, noise meters and all these things. And what our take was, let's try to work with what's already out there. We don't, we don't need another ordinance, right? And the chief said that they could effectively um, monitor the noise and deal with the noise using existing things that they have in place. And I think that same philosophy carried over with this. Um, as Attorney Fiango said, there are way more complicated ways to do this. We wanted to keep it fairly simple rather than establishing a whole new permitting process and all, all these things, right? It seems like it's just much more simple just to say, let's regulate the hours and let's try to, let's try to handle it that way. So I, I think that's, I probably shouldn't speak for the whole council. Um, we have three other members here. If they'd wish to speak, I would ask if they would also be recognized. But that's, that was the overall philosophy we were trying to do, not create something else totally unnecessary. Um, and may I just say one other thing, not to this point, please. Um, I was somewhat offended by some of the remarks that were made, um, insinuating that the council is somehow racist. And that's what I'll say. Would any of the other town councilors like to speak? I know two of them already have. So. <laughs> All right, Representative Streeter. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Out of due diligence, when I received this ordinance, uh, I visited three other uh, BYOB establishments. Um, a couple of places where you bring in a bottle of wine with your wife to enjoy dinner. Another place uh, was a person bringing one beer to have with his grinder. However, on the other establishments, and, and I'll speak specifically about Midnight Hooker Lounge, uh, in comparison to the other places, I did not see, which I did at the Midnight Hooker Lounge, on the front door that has a, a large international no signs for drugs, guns, and knives. That concerned me. In one of my evenings when I just sat in the parking lot, as well as the evening I met Mr. Whitehouse there, I was concerned because I was watching the security personnel patting down the patrons of this. That concerned me. In conjunction with that, having had law enforcement background myself, I was concerned that they were only patting down the males, not the females. Uh, common sense would say if I, had a, if I was a male and I had a gun, I would give it to my female partner and have her bring it in for me. 
But what really concerned me was the night I was met with Mr. Whitehouse. When I pulled into the driveway at quarter to three in the morning, there were five police officers there. I believe they were proactive. There, was, there were no activities. There was no <coughs> fights or anything like that going on. I think they were proactive looking or trying to prevent other incidents from happening there. My concern there was where, where are the other patrols? Where are the other districts' protection? They've been subtracted upon to pay attention to this particular establishment. A comment I would like to make, uh, it was brought up several times, that this will take the person in, or the business and put it out of business. Well, Mr. Whitehouse provided some information uh, that on weekend evenings, patrons are charged $15 cover charge to enter the lounge, and with other words saying this was caused by, by some other problems, and that your charge roughly covers the cost of professional security staff. So I don't know how this business is going to be making a profit if they're taking the $15 cover charge and paying it to cover security. I, I certainly believe that this ordinance is here to help us regulate, to promote the safety and welfare of our citizens, as well as to protect our citizens from the potential, I'm not saying it would happen, but from the potential of having somebody having too much to drink because of, there's no controls per se, and then, uh, God forbid, having an accident with serious injuries. <clears throat> Another gentleman spoke this evening about, well, there's a potential, uh, if, if the lounge closes, there's the potential that the town would be sued. If we veto this, and God forbid there is a serious incident at that particular lounge, i.e. a shooting, or if somebody leaves that lounge and has a serious accident. I'm sure some attorneys, and we're looking at two or three in this audience, would certainly say, wait a minute, you vetoed this. You are partly responsible for the incident that took place because you <coughs> ignored taking appropriate responsibility. So I definitely will be voting uh, not to veto this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Bauer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I've been listening to all these <clears throat> arguments. We seem to be more interested in some entity out there that we have to make sure, make sure that somebody does not get hurt or that somebody uh, does not act uh, sober. We forget that most people in this country drink, they drink responsibly, they work, they go to, out after work and have a drink with their friends, they go out after dinner and have a drink with other friends, no matter what it is, there is. There are people who work in this area who don't get out of work till one or two o'clock in the afternoon. They're hardworking people. They're fulfilling the needs of this community. And if they can't go with a friend and with their own bottle, they don't, shouldn't even have to have the bottle, they should be able to buy it, to a bar to have a drink, they shouldn't be thought of as criminals and people who are going to sneak around. I think we need to think clearly. If your father or your brother or you have a job that lets you out of work, that you go to every single day, let you come home at one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning, you're wide awake, there's no place to go, there's nothing to do, your friends may get together, but it's nice if they can get together and have a beer. 
it's nice if they could get together and have a glass of wine. Or take their wife to a little place and have a glass of wine or a beer. This idea that we all have to be so absolutely safe and not put into a situation where somebody 100 miles away gets run over by a car, that's not what we should be doing. We should be making our world better for the people who live in it. And we should be making our world better for the hard working people in this country and in this city who go every day and work, no matter what their jobs are, what the hours are. They work, they raise their families, they send their children to school. But you want to say, oh, they want a beer at 2 o'clock in the morning after they come home from work. <laughs> it's not a. <laughs> What it is is a normal way of responding to being a human being. And this does not allow that. I've lived in Connecticut a long time. But before I came to Connecticut, I lived in many places. And I have never seen a place that was so worried about someone having a drink <laughs> as they do here. Amen. So thank you. Yeah. I yeah. will vote not to let this ordinance through if they want a uh, uh, to make one that makes some sense, yep. then I might be in favor of it. But I'm not going to be in favor of this silliness because it's demeaning to a human being, it's demeaning to our workers, it's demeaning to me. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Wells. Well, I, I think someone said things better than I could. <laughs> but what I, I would... Uh, I know there's nothing, there's been much made of the requirements for getting uh, a license to sell alcohol. And there's nothing in this ordinance that would apply any of those restrictions to BYOBs. They are still, other than the fact that they can't sell you the alcohol, you have to bring your own. I would probably, uh, I, I actually gave some, I think that uh, from, from what I've heard about the security there, the fact that they're, checking people at the door. Nobody wants to run a bloody bucket business. There's no future in it. They've got security at the door. They don't let people in drunk. They're even uh, checking people for, for weapons. They have security inside. And they even regulate the people leaving in there. It's probably the safest place to go at that hour of the night. Other than the fact that I'd go there. I don't work shift work, so I'd have to stay up late. I'd probably have to go after I was in another bar. The, Biggest risk is that I'd show up and the police would be lurking about and catch, catch me wobbling out of my car and, and, and have me blowing up a balloon. I would point out they don't, if you go into a bar, one, the first thing they say is, what do you have to drink? This place, they say, here's the hookah, grab your hubbly bubbly, you know, pay $15. They're not pushing drinks. They don't get tips based on how much they sell you. They don't put the salty snacks out in front of you to make you thirsty. When you're finished, when you're pretty much finished with your drink, they don't say, are you ready for another? They don't turn on the lights and say, last call. It's your last chance to get a drink before we, this is the last chance you have to get a drink before you leave. And this is what happens in places where the bar, and they, of course, they will cut you off once you are drunk. But as you leave the bar, you could be wobbling out of there. Now, I've, I've been fortunate, I've never had the opportunity to take a sobriety test, but uh, I'm, I'm sure there have been plenty of times when I would have flunked it easily. Uh, and uh, as far as safety goes, I, I think uh, you gentlemen know that uh, there is a bar in Groton that a year ago, a fellow was sucker punched at the, jaw, at the bar had uh, dental work, broken jaw, had to go to Yale New Haven Hospital, and the assailant was a state police officer. <laughs> now, in some defense, when you're drinking, the first thing to go is your judgment. That's it's axiomatic. You're fine, everything's fine, and you're out of control. So here's a, a state police officer, plenty of training, lots of experience, and got himself into this circumstance. That was last year. Same bar, this year, this time, 
It's a bartender from one of the very popular bars in downtown West. I happened to stick my head in the door last Saturday night. The place was packed. This, this guy's a bartender. Excuse me, he is this pertinent the to the ordinance? What? Is this pertinent to the ordinance? Yeah, this okay. guy is, this, yeah. this fellow is experienced. He's, a, he's done the, what is it, the tips program. He knows drinking, he knows bars. He got sucker punched. Thousands of dollars worth of dental work. In, this is inside the bar. Now you could reduce the hours. I think these happen, these are late night. I think we could reduce the hours in these bars to 10 o'clock. We'd have a small riot of businesses down here saying, if you, you make us cut off drinking at 9 or 10 o'clock, you'll ruin our business. Everybody will go to Stonington, New London, Norwich. It'll put us out of business. It'll put us all out of business. Thank you very much. Representative Gustafson. Thank you. Just wanted to share a couple of thoughts. Um, as was stated earlier, you know, we're not regulating hookah. It's, um, they're talking about regulating the consumption of alcohol. Um, I question the notion that it would actually close a business definitively. I don't know if that, that I don't think you can prove something like that. Um, not having done hookah before, no. I think people like to smoke and drink at the same time, but I don't know why I can't just smoke and not drink um, if this were to pass. Um, that being said, I think in the um, you know, interest of uniformity and avoiding any you know, uh, accusations of bias, in my opinion, um, bring the hours in line with just licensed establishments probably make more sense. Um, so I just wanted to thank the town council for their work on it. I don't think they acted in any, you know, in any um, biased way. Um, can I ask you a question? You had mentioned there was a third option. Can you just repeat the Sure. Was? This is from the town clerk. I'll let the town clerk elaborate, but my understanding is if this ordinance goes through, we can, as an RGM, use our power initiative to provide amendments to that ordinance. Well, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a saying that this, well, the 21st of this month, this will come into law unless it's vetoed uh, before that date. So, um, the town charter 4.5 allows the RTM to, uh, upon a majority vote of total membership, so that's a majority of the total membership, um, shall have the power to propose to the council any legislative ordinance or resolution, and it has exceptions, of course. But yes, this body has a, has always had, and I've explained this to uh, uh, this body more than once, that this is the most powerful body, elected body in the town, because you not only approve uh, the budget, but you also can propose law that has to go, has to be decided. So, um, I think that's remarkable. So, if the council doesn't act on your uh, power of initiative, it directly goes to the voters. Representative Martin. Uh, Martin. Can, can we move the question? We've been at this for quite some time, and I think everybody's feelings are clear, one way or the other. Is that a motion? That is a motion. Second. Okay, that's non-debatable, and it takes a two-thirds majority to pass. So all in favor of calling the question, please raise your hand. The vote is to call the question, and that is to move the vote. No, Alicia? Or Representative Bauer? You're voting no. Any abstentions? One abstention. Oh, I did call for the no votes. That carries, so uh, we are going to um, uh, come to a vote, and so I would like uh, roll call vote. Uh, can I, I'm just going to acknowledge that, oh, is that all you were saying? Yes, you're going to point out <coughs> requesting a um, roll call vote, please. Yes, <laughs> that was requested. Um, 
So uh, could uh, you please read the motion that's on the floor? Because people may, I don't want anyone to be confused about what we're voting on. This does take two thirds. It does take 28 votes. Of, the entire membership, not of, the people here. of 41, of the 41 uh, member body. So that would be 28. Hours of operation. No one can hear you. Oh, oh I'm not up. Uh, can, you, can we hear it? No. Here, come up. Yeah, come on. Uh, so the motion on the floor is to veto uh, the ordinance. Um, the, uh, to establish hours of operation for the BYOB establishments. So you, if you want to veto this ordinance, you'll vote yes. If you, do, if you don't want to veto, you will vote no. Is that clear? So yes vote means to veto, to stop the ordinance. A no vote means it goes through, it continues on. It, it is passed already, but you're not gonna interfere. Is that, is that clear? There are no questions, so mm -hmm. we'll proceed. This will be a roll call vote. So Again, it's 28. Just a simple yes if you want to veto, no if you do not. Okay. Representative Adams? Abstain. Okay. Uh, Bailey? No. Bauer? Yes. Bordelon? Yes. Chase? No. Doyle? Oops. Frickman? No. Gustafson? No. Hanscom? Yes. Katowski? No. Marley? Oops. Uh, Martin? No. Massett? No. McDermott? Yes. Melendez? Yes. Mello? No, Miller. Miller. Mello Miller? She said no. Uh, she said no? That's correct. Merritt? Abstain. Monaghan? No. Newsom? No. Oliver? No. Pasqualini? No. Perry? Yes. Powers? No. Uh, Pacini, Pacino? Yes. <clears throat> Quinn, oops. Richards? No. Rogers? Yes. Stanford? Yes. <clears throat> Streeter, Irma? No. Streeter, James? No. Strode? Wells? Yes. White House? Yes. Whitney? Yes. Evan? No. Well, that motion fails. Um, 13 in favor, 17 opposed, two abstentions. Thank you. All right, so that motion fails. Uh, we can go on to the next item on our agenda. Let me dig out my agenda. <coughs> All right, the next, I don't believe we have any more committee um, reports, uh, and I think I will skip budget discussions as it is 1030. Is there any other business that members would like to bring before the body? There's a motion to adjourn, said second. And Pasqualini. Uh, all in, sorry, all in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? <laughs> Thank you. Motion, the meeting is over. Thank you very much for staying here till.